welcome to this session and yes this session we will discuss the most important the most coveted the most um talked about chapter of our syllabus which is pgbp profits and gains of business and profession that is what is the agenda of today's session all right good morning good morning shipra good morning om good morning kirti good morning yogesh ravi devrata sumit ghosh vanshi anji reddy vishnu prasad rajashri deeptesh jyotesh yashika megha pankaj good morning good morning nandini sangeeta shalu good morning everyone a very good morning and yes let's start our chapter the name of the chapter is pgbp and yes guys this particular chapter is not only relevant for cma intermediate students but it is it is also relevant for cma final students so guys the entire chapter of pgbp is equally important for final students as well so whatever is the course content of cma intermediate it is as it is applicable to cma final students as well so cma final students also must look at this video very closely must um uh, uh, you know uh, study from this video very closely because this is relevant not only for cma intermediate but for cma final students as well as cma final students already know their book does not contain their study material does not contain pgbp chapter so it is to be extracted from the cma intermediate study module as it is so cma inter study module contains pgbp chapter that is applicable for cma final students as well same goes for chapters like capital gains guys capital gains is not there in cma final study material that capital gains should be derived from cma intermediate study material so whatever uh, uh, chapters are there in cma in intermediate study material those are equally relevant for cma final students as well yes that is how your curriculum is planned that is how your curriculum is structured okay so let's start one of the most important chapters of our syllabus which is pgbp profits and gains of business and profession and guys this chapter needs no emphasis this is the most important chapter of your syllabus and from an exam standpoint this chapter is really important because it commands huge weightage not only from your exam standpoint but also apart from exams your practical life also if you happen to um, uh, enter into direct taxation field if you happen to enter into a consultancy of direct taxation or uh, some kind of uh, stream which is related to direct taxation then guys this is one and only most important uh, uh, chapter the most important head of your practical life as well so in my career of past 10 years of working for the big fours i have worked uh, almost almost 10 years uh, in the big four in their direct taxation division and guys um, 90% of the times 90% of the times i have referred only and only to pgbp sections section 28 to section 44 90 95% of the times i have referred only to pgbp sections that is how important pgbp chapter and pgbp sections are to all of you not only from an exam standpoint of course from an exam standpoint it's very very important but from standpoint of your practical life when you go to industry when you start your own practice uh, and you happen to do direct taxation as one of your um, uh, subjects and as one of your practice um, uh, methods then guys pgvp will definitely take a uh, take a major portion of your career major portion of your um, uh, working life as well so pgvp i'll broadly discuss what all things are we going to discuss in pgbp chapter okay so these are the contents of pgbp chapter these are all the things that we are going to discuss in pgbp chapter first of all we are going to discuss the difference between business and profession this is exactly the same as we have studied in our 11th standard business studies book okay it is exactly the same business and profession the difference between business and profession standard 11th business studies book it is exactly the same then we are going to discuss about incomes and expenditures which are allowable under pgbp head and guys this is a constant feature of all the five heads of income that in all the five heads of income we are uh, continuously we are continuously repeating this element that you know under all five heads of income we are talking about two things incomes which are taxable under that head that head and expenses which are deductible from that head that is what we are discussing in all the chapters consistently so that is the second ask which we are going to study and yes guys in this particular chapter expenditures will be a little detailed which means 
एक्सपेंडिचर्स विल हैव टू एलिमेंट्स जनरल एक्सपेंडिचर्स एंड स्पेशल एक्सपेंडिचर्स तो रिडक्शंस आर ऑफ टू टाइप्स अंडर पीजीबीपी इट इज ओनली अंडर पीजीबी दैट दिस हैपेंस दैट डिडक्शंस विल हैपन टू बी um the most critical thing which we are going to analyze and they are of two types generic uh, deductions or um uh, specified deductions or special deductions okay and one of the examples of general deductions is depreciation guys depreciation is allowable as a revenue expenditure from computing the income from pg bp then there will be certain special deductions also uh, so what do you mean by special what is so special about them we'll be studying it um then we'll see what is so special about these special deductions then we have disallowed expenditure <clears throat> so guys <clears throat> some of these expenditures will be disallowed due to certain non compliances some of these expenditures which we'll be studying over here which usually is allowable those expenditure we will not allow because there'll be some miscompliances which will happen because of the miscompliance we will not allow the um, uh, deduction of certain expenditures under the pgvp head that is the head of disallowed expenditure that is the meaning of disallowed expenditure that is what we are going to study over here then next is maintenance of books of accounts and tax audit of course the tax officer or the income tax department needs to be sure that you have prepared your books of accounts properly you have complied with all the sections which are given under income tax act the income tax act needs to be sure about that hence there are provisions of maintenance of books of accounts and tax audit tax audit being one of the most important sections of this particular uh, chapter and last we are going to study presumptive taxation what do you mean by presumptive taxation presumptive taxation means uh, where the taxation happens on an estimate basis we are not able to reliably uh, form a profit and loss account and compute the income of that particular business we are just um, uh, trying to um, uh, you know presume or assume certain numbers to uh, tax this particular business that is known as presumptive taxation on the basis of presumption or on the basis of um now guess work will be estimating the income of certain businesses because those businesses um uh, maintenance of books of accounts is not happening is not possible also so for those businesses we have presumptive taxation regime where books of accounts will not be maintained and will be assuming uh, certain profit and loss to be income of those kind of businesses yes it sounds weird you would be thinking that's a what weird thing are you saying that we will assume certain uh, profits we will assume certain income in these businesses but yes guys that is so uh, there are certain businesses where the income is assumed this is known as presumptive taxation all right so these are the various elements of pgbp chapter which we are going to study in this particular um, uh, session yes we are not able to we will not be able to complete all the topics in today's session so we'll be carried carrying it forward till till thursday or maybe one more session is required for pgvp but now guys we are going to start the first and the basic concept of pgvp what is the difference between business and profession so guys the the basic difference between business and profession is that business is a recurring economic activity any economic activity which is recurring that is known as business any economic activity which is recurring that is known as business so business is any activity which is recurring it includes trade manufacture or commerce it includes trade manufacture or commerce and profession means something where application of skill is required where skill is being applied that is known as profession where uh, you are not selling or purchasing any goods or services you are applying your skill which means you are a uh, accountant by profession and you are applying your accountancy skills you are doctor by profession you are applying your medical skills you are engineer by profession you are applying your uh, mechanical or 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 any kind of any engineering skills so those are known as professions so business or profession any income which is earned from either of these two heads that is known as business or profession income pgbp profits or gains of business or profession application of skill acquired through special learning qualification like doctor cma etc these are known as professionals includes vocation also what do you mean by vocation guys vocation means you have seen all these um uh, you know reality shows which are booming up in uh, uh, tv these days uh, re reality shows like dance india dance or you know superstars ki khoj or hunarbaaz kaun banega hunarbaaz so these are the reality shows where small small kids come up uh, and they showcase their talent new generation young generation come up and they showcase their talent this is known as um, uh, vocation and in case of vocation guys uh, income is taxable as a profession itself so vocation uh profession includes a vocation profession includes a vocation 
नेचुरल टैलेंट ऑफ अ पर्सन लाइक सिंगिंग डांसिंग एक्टिंग और एनी काइंड ऑफ मैजिशियन इफ इफ किड इज अ मैजिशियन ओके ऑल दीज आर नोन एज वोकेशन सो वोकेशन आर टैक्सेबल इनकम फ्रॉम वोकेशन इज ऑल्सो टैक्सेबल अंडर प्रोफेशन सो प्रोफेशन इंक्लूड्स वोकेशन एज वेल नाउ गाइज वी गेट टू नाउ स्टडी वॉट आर द इनकम्स विच आर टैक्सेबल अंडर द हेड पी जी बी पी वॉट आर वेरियस काइंड ऑफ इनकम विच आर टैक्सेबल अंडर द हेड पी जी बी पी सेक्शन ट्वेंटी एट इज द रेलिवेंट सेक्शन सो द इनकम विच आर टैक्सेबल अंडर द हेड पी जी बी पी आर एनी काइंड ऑफ इनकम फ्रॉम बिजनेस ऑफ प्रोफेशन इंक्लूडिंग एनी स्पेक्यूलेटिव बिजनेस एंड गाइज इवन इफ यू हैव अर्न एनी इनकम फ्रॉम एन इलीगल बिजनेस दैट इज ऑल्सो इंक्लूडेड अंडर पी जी बी पी so income tax act doesn't differentiate between a legal income and an illegal income any kind of income which you have earned income tax act will say pay taxes on that yeah that is a different thing that if you are earning illegal income then you have you will be uh, charged under the legal provisions of criminal acts as well civil or criminal acts as the case may be they will be charged upon you uh, you might be devoid of your income which you have earned from illegal sources that can also be the situation but income tax act says even if you have earned illegal income even if you have um, earned Uh, income like income from speculative business, then that is also taxable under the head PGBP. So Ishita Khemani says, sir, under your vocation types show like Shark Tank is included. No, Ishita, Shark Tank is not included under vocation. Why? Because Shark Tank, um, uh, the money is not being earned as uh, income; it is being infused as capital. So whosoever is appearing in Shark Tank and the person who is getting money, getting funds, he is not getting income. It is not revenue income. it is capital which is being infused in his business it is capital receipt it is not income so if i go to shark tank and i request um uh, the judges to uh, fund my business my um a business of coaching i want to expand my coaching to outside the uh, country outside india also i want to expand in united states of america i want to expand in australia um uh, i want to expand my coaching if i ask for funds from them they give me funds suppose they give me funds of 1 crore rupees they are not my income they are not my income that is capital infusion in my business that is not income that will be not be charged as income it is capital infusion so that is not a vocation it is a source of capital of any business okay sir someone is saying big boss ha huh? ravi gupta is saying big boss ravi gupta you only see these kind of uh, tv shows like big boss na like All right, compensation to management agencies. So, guys, um, there are certain management agencies who uh, would undertake to run your business. So, if you have a business and you want some uh, professionals to run your business on your behalf, obviously under your supervision, then the money which management agency receives for providing such kind of services that will be taxable as PGBP. Any income from trade or professional association for providing services to its member. Any kind of trade or professional association like. a uh, trade association like fikki trade association like asocham any kind of trade up association which um, uh, derives income from um, uh, providing services to the member that is taxable as pgvp any export incentives like sale of dpb duty entitlement passbook duty drawback so guys when you will study customs in your um, uh, group 2 then you will understand what do you mean by duty drawback what do you mean by dpb these are the benefits which are derived by any exporter on exporting of goods or services so any kind of this benefit which is derived by the exporter that is also taxable as pgbp remuneration to partners of firm or llp including interest bonus commission salary everything is taxable as pgbp so if any partner gets anything from the partnership firm sir what if partner is getting salary from the partnership firm even then it is taxable as pgbp because partner and the partnership firm are not two different people they are one and the same people since they are one and the same people therefore guys any income which is uh, received by the partner from the firm that is taxable as um, uh, uh, pgbp income in the hands of the partner also not as salary not as salary so partner even if it is he is getting salary it is not taxed as salary okay sir the non compete fees or exclusivity agreement now guys um there is some non compete fee which might be payable so for example uh, uh, you know uh, there are two brothers both the brothers are engaged in their family business of say jewelry making now one of the brothers tell the other brother that you leave this business and you do not do this business for next 10 years in this particular area i will pay you 1 crore rupees for not um, uh, competing with me for not coming in this particular business for next 10 years that is known as non compete fees so guys non compete fees is also taxable as income all that is not um, uh, earned for running business it is earned for uh, leaving business it is earned for 
uh, a not running business then also not com non compete fee is taxable as pgbp in the hands of the recipient exclusivity agreement if you uh, have some agreement of exclusivity with someone which means that you are exclusively dealing with certain goods and you want in future also you deal with these goods exclusively then that exclusivity agreement is um, uh, taxable as pgbp in your hand so whether you are uh, entering into a non compete fee kind of an arrangement which is again kind of um, uh, exclusivity agreement only or if you are um, uh, dealing with the exclusivity agreement both the incomes although they are uh, uh, not earned for running the business they are earned for not running the business that is the mood point of consideration they are earned for not running the business you are uh, forbidding someone from uh, for, from running this business even then guys these two businesses will be taxable as um, uh, these two incomes will be taxable as pgbp pgbp will be the um, relevant head under the under which these two incomes will be taxed then some receive from key man insurance policy key man insurance policy means um, the policy which is taken for topmost professionals or topmost um, uh, management uh, board of directors etc of the company so for those people who are um, the key man of the uh, company key man means the top uh, directors board of directors the managing director etc etc uh, so any re amount received for from key man insurance policy is also a pgbp income then income from illegal business is definitely a pgbp income then what do you mean by notional profits notional profits means anticipated profits which are not taxable notional profits means anticipated profits which are not taxable so profits which are anticipated which we think that we will get but we have not actually got them so anticipated profits or notional profits are uh, not taxable so uh, if we think that this profit is going to be earned by us but it is not actually earned by us then that is known as notional profit or anticipated profit it is not taxable dividends on shares and winning from races uh, lotteries etc is taxable as income from house property so any dividend received from shares or winning from uh, uh, race horses lottery etc is taxable as income from other sources is taxable as income from other sources so guys although income from other sources so although guys um, you might be in a business where you have um, earnings from uh, race horses you might have uh, uh, earnings which you have earned from races or from lotteries etc but guys these income are chargeable to tax under income from other sources head similarly dividends on shares are also taxable as income from other sources head these are not business income these incomes are taxable as income from other sources that is the consideration okay sir okay now 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 guys let us start the most important topic of this particular chapter the most critical topic of this particular chapter and students are very very afraid of this particular chapter of this particular topic of this particular chapter so the ch topic name is deductions topic name is deductions what are the expenses which um, will be reduced while computing the income from pgbp now my question to you is my question to you is from point of view of the income tax act from point of view of income tax act and your hands on the keyboard from point of view of income tax act guys higher the expense better it is or lower the expense better it is from the point of income tax act from the point of view of income tax act higher the expense better it is or lower the expense better it is please write in the chat box higher the better or lower the better in way of expenses yes jyotish you are right jyotish you are right from point of view of income tax act higher the expense better it is or lower the expense better it is very good pankaj very good megha saksham ishita is wrong dipika is right anshul is right diptesh right aditi right ravi gupta right nandini right sadanand right bhavika right yashika right sumit right vanshi right dipika right meraki right shipra right shipra wrong rani right vishnu right 
Kirti right. Very good, guys. Very good. From the point of view of In Income Tax Act, lower the expense, better it is because if the expenses are low, then income tax will be high because profit will be high. So from point of view of Income Tax Act, lower the expense, better it is. Lower the expense, better it is from the point of view of Income Tax Act because then taxes will be higher. And guys, from the point of view of assessee, from the point of view of all of us, the business owner, lower the expense, better it is or higher the expense, better it is. What will we want? As a businessman, what will I want? Do I want higher expenses or do I want lower expenses as a businessman? Pankaj, perfect. Pankaj is right. Yogesh is right. Aditi right, Vishnu right, Anshul, Om, Devadatta, Sarnikya, Namrata, Vishnu, Manshi, Jyotesh, Yashika, Garima, Saksham, Rani, Deeptesh. Very good answer, guys. Very good answer. Very, very good answer. Very good answer. Higher the expense, better it is. So, Sessi will always want that his expenses should be higher. And the Income Tax Act will also always want that the expenses should be lower. So, that if the expenses are lower, then the profits will be higher. If the profits are higher, then taxability will be higher. So, Income Tax Act will want lower expenses. However, we, we as assessees, we as uh, uh, the, the uh, person who is paying taxes, we want higher expenses. That is a fight which will always go on between the Income Tax Act and the assessee. So this fight will be resolved by discussing this topic known as deductions. So this did, these deductions will precisely tell us what expenses are to be allowed while computing the PGBP income. So there are two kinds of expenses, specific expense or generic expense and special expense generic expense means revenue expenditure relating to carrying of business or profession any kind of revenue expenditure which is related to carrying of business and profession is to be debited to the profit and loss account which is prepared as per the tax books is to be debited to the profit and loss account now my question to you is and your hands on the keyboard guys um what if capital expenditure is being incurred what if capital expenditure in, is being incurred? Where is capital expenditure debited to? Is it debited to profit and loss account or is it debited to somewhere else? Please write in the chat box. Where is capital expenditure debited? That is my question. Because revenue expenditure is debited to PL account, that we are very sure. We are very sure about it. But where is capital expenditure debited? Like I have purchased some machinery, I have purchased some fixed assets, I have purchased some vehicle. Where would I debit those? things please write in the chat box where would capital expenditure be debited good morning himang singh balance sheet balance sheet very good nandini is wrong not profit and loss account but balance sheet somewhere else tanisha is fantastic tanisha is saying somewhere else i don't know where but somewhere else <laughs> mega tomar is saying somewhere else balance sheet is the correct answer that the uh, the the uh, capital expenditure will be debited to balance sheet and revenue expenditure will be debited to the profit and loss account. So revenue expenditure which will be debited to the profit and loss account, those revenue expenditure are the eligible deductions. Those revenue expenditure are the eligible deductions. So any revenue expenditure relating to carrying on the business that is debited to PNL account, right? For example, rent, rate, taxes, depreciation, Repairs, maintenance, employees, salary, etc. So, there are two kinds of expenses which are written over here. Specific expenses and general expenses. Specific expenses means those revenue expenditure which are stated in a particular section. Like section 30, 31, 32, etc. There are certain expenses which are stated specific, specifically in the um, uh, in, in a particular section and there are certain general revenue expenditure. General revenue expenditure means which are not mentioned in any specific uh, section, but they are debited to business um, uh, profit and loss account. So the generic sections are not mentioned anywhere. The generic sections, the generic uh, profit and loss account uh, uh, sections, the generic um, uh, uh, expenses are not mentioned anywhere. But they are debited to the PL account. Section 37 says all the expenses which are incurred for business purpose are to be debited to the profit and loss account. Now, this is about revenue expenditure. Now, guys, I'm going to deal with special expenditures. Now, I'm going to deal with special 
expenditure. As I have already told that there's something special about these expenditure. Therefore, these are known as special expenditure. Please write in the comment box. Can capital expenditure be debited to PNL account? Please write in the comment box. Can capital expenditure or should capital expenditure be debited to PNL account? Yes or no? I want to answer in yes or no. Can capital expenditure be debited to PNL account? Anshuli Adav says yes. Anshuli Adav, where have you seen capital expenditure being debited to profit and loss account? Huh? Where? Answer is no. Yes, right, right. No, no, no. Bhavika is also saying yes. I don't know where Bhavika has seen capital expenditure being debited to profit and loss account. Where have you seen Bhavika? Om is right. Vishnu is right. Very good, guys. Very, very good. So, guys, since our 11th standard, we have studied that capital expenditures are not to be taken to profit and loss account since our 11th standard. But under certain special circumstances, if you fulfill certain specified considerations, certain specified conditions, then I will allow capital expenditure to be debited to PNL account as per the Income Tax Act. Yes, this is a big, big, big benefit which is provided by Income Tax Act. Therefore, this is known as special deduction. This is a big benefit which is um, uh, being done by the Income Tax Act, which has been um, uh, proposed by Income Tax Act. If you fulfill certain conditions, if you fulfill certain um, uh, certain uh, uh, preconditions, then the capital expenditure can also be debited to profit and loss account. This is a special deduction case. But yes, guys, naturally, not in all cases. No, 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 no. Not in all cases. This, this doesn't happen in all cases. This happens only in specified cases where certain conditions are met. So these are known as special deductions. I told you there has to be something special about it. Something which is not usual. Special means something which is not usual. And yes, this is something which is not usual that capital expenditure allowed as a deduction under certain specified circumstances. For example, scientific research expenses, expenditure on purchase of plant and machinery, etc. So these are known as special deductions. And yes, if you want these special deductions, you have to fulfill certain terms and conditions which are given under the Income Tax Act. Okay, sir. Got it. So when we'll come to special deductions, then we will see what are those special terms and conditions which are to be fulfilled for claiming deductions of these special, um, uh, special deductions. Yes, sir. So deductions are of two types general deductions and special deductions. And now we are going to start with general deductions first. Then we are going to start with specific reductions. So the first general reduction which we are going to start today is the most important general reduction, which is depreciation. And on the chat box, I want to know why is depreciation levied? Why is depreciation levied? I want to know in the chat box. Okay. The first and foremost uh, deduction which we have in our syllabus is depreciation. My question to you is why is depreciation levied? What is the reason? Why we levy depreciation? Why this expense is incurred? What is the reason why this depreciation is levied? Please write in the chat box why depreciation expense is levied. In the chat box, why is specified deduction? Why is depreciation levied? What is the reason? What is the reason for depreciation uh, being there? What happens that depreciation is levied? That is the question that we are going to uh, 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 ascertain. Perfect. Megha Tomar. Perfect. Kirti Batra. Very good. Tanisha Kanojia. Very good. Wear and tear and technological obsolescence. These are the two reasons. Wear and tear. Ravi Gupta. Very good. Yes, guys, you are absolutely right. The reason why um, uh, the assets are depreciated is that wear and tear of assets happen. Deeptesh, Rani, Hardik. Rajashri, Vishnu, Saksham, Pankaj. Very good. Wear and tear. Very good, guys. So depreciation is levied due to wear and tear. When you actively use a particular asset again and again and again, then wear and tear happens. And thus, the uh, depreciation is levied. The other reason for depreciation to be levied is a flux of time. So if you have purchased a particular asset and you have put to use, you have you've, um, uh, you've, you've installed it, but you have not used it. Then guys, even then your time is running away. Your time is passing by. So due to efflux of time, also depreciation is levied. So 
depreciation primarily is levied due to wear and tear then who can charge depreciation only the legal owner or the beneficial owner can charge depreciation the one who has his name in the uh, records in the registered um, uh, you know deed of that particular asset that particular person can claim uh, the or depreciation obviously that asset should be in your name so the bill should be in the name of the company if the company wants to claim depreciation then the bill of that particular machinery should be there in the name of the company only then the depreciation will be claimed or the beneficial owner can also claim depreciation so if all the benefits of a particular uh, particular asset is being um, uh, is being uh, you know uh, enjoyed by a person despite of the fact that he is not the legal owner or the registered owner of that particular asset even then guys the depreciation is claimable by the beneficial owner so sometimes um, uh, the, the the documentation of transfer of ownership takes time so till the time when uh, documentation is happening till that time beneficial owner can claim depreciation then how is depreciation charged depreciation is charged on the method wdv method on block of asset guys in case of financial accounting we charge depreciation only on slm case okay in case of financial accounting we charge depreciation only using the slm method straight line method but in case of income tax we charge depreciation only on wdv method there is only one exception to this rule which we are going to study in our subsequent uh, classes wdv method is used on block of assets to charge depreciation under the income tax act can slm be used answer is no slm is not used only one exception is there power generating units where slm is used that we are going to discuss separately but otherwise the generic rule is that only wdv method is eligible on block of assets to ascertain the uh, depreciation of a particular asset then rate of charge rate of charge there are specific depreciation rates which are given under the act so depreciation is chargeable only using those specified rates those specified rates uh, will be reduced to 100% of the rate of 50% of the rate depending upon the use of the asset so if the asset is used for more than equal to 180 days in a particular year if the asset is used for more than equal to 180 days in a particular year then 100% of the prescribed rate of depreciation is charged if the asset is used for less than 180 days in a particular year then 50% of prescribed rate of depreciation is charged so in case of financial accounting guys um, we prorate the depreciation on the basis of number of days also so if the asset has been purchased say on 15th may then even 15 days depreciation will be charged but this is not the case in uh, income tax income tax has made it little easier income tax had just said that if the assets are being used for more than 180 days then 100% of the depreciation rate is applicable so if the depreciation rate is say 20% then 20% depreciation will be charged but if the asset is used for less than 180 days then half of the depreciation which means only 10% of the depreciation will be charged um, uh, in that particular year then in case of mixed use and professional personal and professional joint ownership of the asset depreciation is to be split on the basis of number of days used so if you have used um, your depreciation your uh, asset partly for personal use partly for business use then guys the depreciation will be split amongst the two uh, things then joint ownership of asset if uh, asset is being owned by two owners two owners are cumulatively holding a particular asset then also depreciation will be split into two parts based on number of days of depreciation uh, of asset used by each of the joint owner that is the rule okay sir so how do we compute depreciation in this particular case this is the chart which is showing computation of depreciation how is depreciation computed this is the chart which is showing that okay so we take opening wdv then we add purchases to the opening wdv we take opening wdv wdv means written down value which is the value which is the closing value of the previous year that is taken as opening value of the current year so opening wdv add assets purchased during the year less sales proceed of assets sold during the year whatever assets are sold during the year its sales proceeds is reduced please note please note please note in financial accounting we do not reduce the sales proceed we actually reduce the book value of that particular asset over here that is the difference between financial accounting and income tax in case of financial accounting we reduce book value of assets over here however in case of fun, uh, income tax we reduce sales proceed over here i'll give you an example okay i purchase an asset for 20000 rupees depreciation rate is 10% so after one year the value of the asset book value of the asset is 18000 rupees 
Now suppose that particular asset was sold in nineteen thousand rupees. Then guys, as per the financial accounting, we will reduce eighteen thousand over here, which is the WDV of that asset. However, as per the Income Tax Act, we will reduce nineteen thousand over here and not eighteen thousand. That is a slight difference between the method which is um, adopted for computing depreciation in case of financial accounting versus the method which is adopted uh, for um, uh, computing depreciation in case of uh, income tax. That is the difference. Okay, sir. So next, WDV. This cannot be negative. WDV is the residuary figure. Then less depreciation. We put depreciation on this WDV. Depreciation and the closing WDV is computed like that. Okay. So this is the. This is the chart which will tell you how to compute depreciation in case of income tax, and the major difference which I can see in this um, computation as compared to the financial accounting computation is the sales proceed. That is the major difference which is there over here. Yes, please, Ravi Gupta. Fourth October is the right date for one eighty days more or one eighty days less. Right, fourth October. Okay, so A, B, C, D. I have written down the uh, the the formulas over here. B is the assets which are purchased in case purchases during the year, in case purchases during the year have been put to use for less than one eighty days in the year of purchase. Then depreciation is charged at fifty percent of the normal rate. So that is the uh, thing which we had discussed earlier as well, guys. That if the assets are being used for less than one eighty days, then fifty percent of the normal rate will be applicable. Then date of sale of asset is irrelevant when when the asset has been sold. That is irrelevant whether it has been sold after using it for more than one eighty days, less than one eighty days. That is irrelevant. Sales proceed will be reduced in its entirety from the closing WDV. Okay, in its entirety. Depreciation is not charged in the following cases when WDV is negative and when WDV is positive, but the block doesn't have. Any asset in such a case, positive balance is equal to short-term capital loss. So there are two cases where depreciation is not charged. There are two cases where depreciation is not charged. A, this WDV becomes negative or it becomes zero. So it cannot become negative. So it will at max become zero. So when WDV is uh, zero, then we don't charge depreciation. Or when WDV is there, but the block ceases to exist. What do you mean by block ceases to exist? Block ceases to exist means that there are no assets in this particular block. All the assets have been sold. Although some WDV has been left because there might be a difference between um, uh, the opening WDV and the sales during the year, there might be some WDV which is left in terms of monetary uh, value, but the assets are not there in this uh, in this particular block. Assets have ceased to exist. Assets have finished from this particular block. Under these two situations, depreciation is not charged. In the following cases, depreciation will not be charged. These are the two cases where depreciation is not charged. And guys, trust me. You have to, you have to, you have to do question number one of or your study mat. I don't, um, uh, I don't know from where have you taken coaching of uh, direct taxation, but wherever you have taken coaching from direct taxation, open your book, open your book, CMA study mat. I'm talking about CMA study mat, CMA Institute study mat. Open that study mat, PGBP chapter of intermediate. Even this this advisory is also for final students. CMA intermediate, PGBP chapter. Open study mat. Illustration number one. Case A to case O. Case A to case O. Just do all those questions, and your uh, entire depreciation uh, computation will be covered from that particular question. A beautiful question which has been prepared by CMA Institute, and that question will cover all the permutations and combinations which will um, uh, come to you for computation of depreciation, and all your doubts with respect to um, uh, depreciation will be. Covered uh, in that particular question. So one question illustration number one, case A to case O. All your doubts with respect to depreciation will be covered from that particular question, that particular illustration. So that is what I would advise you to do. Question number one of PGBP chapter. Illustration number one of PGBP chapter. Now, sir, please tell us that are there any specified rates which are. Are there any specified uh, rates which are okay? Jyotish is asking one question. Jyotish is saying, if the year of purchase and capitalization is different, then will that 180 day rule work? So, guys, this 180 day 180 day rule will not work if your purchase date and your put to use date is different year. So, I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example. So, I have purchased my A set on first November, two thousand twenty-two. I have purchased a set on 
1st November 2022. Now I have put to use this particular asset on 1st January 2023. I have put to use this asset on 1st January 2023. This asset is um, uh, having a depreciation rate say of 10%. Okay. Say of 10% the depreciation rate is there. Please tell me in the chat box for financial year 2000 for financial year 2022-23 what is the depreciation please tell me in the chat box the asset is worth 2 lakh rupees the asset is worth 2 lakh rupees the asset which is purchased is of 2 lakh rupees asset is worth 2 lakh rupees i have purchased it on 1st november 2022 i have put to use that particular asset on 1st january 2023 Please tell me the depreciation for amount of depreciation. I'm talking about amount of depreciation for the financial year 2023. What is the amount of depreciation for financial year 2023? So it is 2 lakh multiplied by 10%, 20,000 divided by 2. Perfect. The correct answer is 10,000 rupees. The correct answer is 10,000 rupees. 50% will be the depreciation. Anshul Yadav is wrong. Yes, right. Perfect. 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 Great guys. Great going. So the put to use date, since it is less than 180 days, the depreciation will be, which will be charged at 10,000 rupees. Now, now, now I'll change my question a little bit. Okay. I'll change my question a little bit. So this particular asset is put to use on 1st April 2023. This particular asset is put to use on 1st April 2023. Now, please tell me what is the depreciation which will be charged in financial year 2022-23? What is the depreciation which will be charged in the financial year 2023? The depreciation which will be charged. Pankaj Kumar has given the entire computation also. Wow. Very good, Pankaj. <laughs> okay. So, the asset is put to use on 1st April 2023. Asset was purchased on 1st November 2022. I'm asking you, what is the depreciation which is to be charged in financial year 22-23? What is the depreciation which is to be charged? Oh, Om, Aditi, Yogesh, Pankaj. Very good answer. Ravi Gupta is Nalayak. He's saying 20,000. The answer is nil. The answer is zero. You will not charge any depreciation because the asset is not put to use in financial year 22-23. All right. And now tell me, guys. What is the depreciation which is to be charged in financial year 23-24? What is the depreciation which is to be charged in financial year 23-24? What is the depreciation? Amount of depreciation is 20,000 rupees. What is the depreciation which is to be charged in 23-24? The amount of depreciation is 20,000 rupees for financial year 23-24, which is the next financial year or the previous year. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Very good, very good. Now I'll change the question a little bit, okay? I'll change the question now, okay? So, the asset is put to use on 1st December 2023. The asset is put to use on 1st December 2023. Yes, even after one year, the asset was put to use on 1st December 2023. Now guys, in this particular part, please tell me what is the depreciation which is to be charged in 2223. What is the depreciation which is to be charged in 22-23? In the financial year 22-23, what is the depreciation which is to be charged? Again, the answer is zero. Again, the answer is zero. In 22-23, there is no capitalization which is happening. There is no capitalization. Therefore, there is no depreciation in 22-23. The depreciation in 22-23 is nil. Yes, very good. Depreciation in 22-23 is nil. Nil, nil, nil. Perfect, nil. Perfect, Om. Perfect, Kirti. Perfect, Vanshi. Deeptesh. Ranojit. Karthik. Rishabh. Rishabh is wrong. How did he arrive at 25,000? I don't know. Meraki is wrong. Aditi, right? So, financial year 22-23, the depreciation is zero. Now, my critical question. What will be the depreciation for 23-24? What will be the depreciation of 23-24? What will be the depreciation for 23-24? What depreciation will you, will you charge in 23-24? So, 22-23, there is no capitalization. Therefore, no 
depreciation. What will be the depreciation in 23-24? Will it be 10,000 or will it be 20,000? Pankaj is saying 10,000, Karthik is saying 10,000, Deepika is saying 10,000. 2223 is 0. 2223 depreciation is 0. Because in financial year 2223, there is no capitalization which is happening. Therefore, 2223 is 0. What will happen in 2324? The answer is 20,000. But why, sir? In year 2324, the put to use is less than 180 days. In the year 23-24, the put to use is less than 180 days. Then, sir, why didn't you do half over here? Guys, the principle of half is only and only applicable when the year of purchase and year of put to use is the same. Please tell me in this particular case, what is year of purchase? Guys, the year of purchase is 21-22. This is the year of purchase. And what is the year of put to use? Year of put to use is So, year of purchase is 22-23. Year of purchase is 22-23. And what is the put to use um, uh, year? Put to use year is 23-24. <coughs> put to use year is 23-24. When put to, year, put to use year is different from purchase year, when put to use year is different from purchase year, then this concept of 180 days more, 180 days less is not applicable. Then, guys, entire depreciation is given in the year when it was put to use if the put to use is a separate year or the, if the put to use is a different year the concept of 180 days more or less is only applicable where the year of purchase and year of put to use are one and the same years if the years are different purchase year is different put to use year is different then guys the 180 days rule doesn't apply even when the assets are used for less than 180 days full depreciation is chargeable full depreciation is chargeable Okay, now we come on to the depreciation rates. So what are the depreciation rates which are specified under the Income Tax Act? That is what we are going to discuss now. And sir, would these depreciation rate differ um, uh, according to the will of the assessee? Can assessee say that in my case, the depreciation rate is different? Answer is no. The depreciation is fixed. The depreciation rates are fixed as per the Income Tax Act and those depreciation rates are the fixed depreciation rates which we are going to study now. So the depreciation rates which are there as per the Income Tax Act are spread into these blocks. These are known as block of assets. Okay. So first block is building block. So if your building is a residential building, then the depreciation is 5%. If your building is a non-residential building, which is a commercial building, which includes hotels, boardings, go down, office, factory, etc., then 10% is the depreciation rate and any temporary construction, temporary construction means any kind of um, uh, temporary shades, sheds are lead or some, um, uh, you know, some steel uh, roof is there or some uh, roof is there, which is temporary, which is not made of um, uh, cement and, um, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the pakka material. Then guys, those temporary constructions are eligible for 40%. They are eligible for 40% depreciation. No, no, Ishita, we don't, we don't count months in case of depreciation, in case of income tax, we don't count months. Either it is more than 180 or it is less than 180. That's it. We don't count months. Full depreciation or half depreciation. Months are never counted. So, furniture, the depreciation rate is 10%. Furniture, the depreciation rate is 10%. Intangible assets like goodwill, like any kind of Asset which you cannot touch or see, that uh, dep that depreciation rate is 25%. It includes patent, trademark, license, etc. Then plant and machinery. This is the most critical block. And sir, do we have to remember all these rates? Yes, guys. Um, you know, most probably your examination question will contain the rates which are um, uh, specified. But still, you should remember these rates. So rates are oil wells, 15%. Ocean going ships, vessels, speedboats, 20%. Motor car, lorry, bus used for hiring purposes, 30%. Computer, including software, books owned by professionals, 40%. Air or water pollution control equipment, 40%. Any other kind of plant and machinery, 15%. So, guys, the most critical rate which is there on this particular chart is the others. 
you should remember that other plant and machinery which is not specified plant and machinery is generally chargeable as at 15 percent rate so if the question is silent on what kind of plant and machinery is it you should always take the rate as 15 percent 15 percent should be the depreciation rate if the question is silent that um uh, you know what rate is there then you should always take 15 percent depreciation rate okay so now we come on to the concept of additional depreciation now this is a very very important concept guys um you know in certain circumstances we give depreciation over and above the original depreciation so original depreciation is of course applicable original depreciation is of course um uh, provided but over and above the original depreciation additional depreciation is also levied in certain plant and machinery in certain cases additional depreciation is also levied so additional depreciation the rate of additional depreciation is 20 percent yes in your books um now there's a rate which is given for backward notified backward areas which is 35 percent but guys that rate is the old rate because that deduction is uh, now not available after 31st march 2020 that deduction is not available so now the reduction which is applicable in your case is only 20 percent of additional depreciation deduction what do you mean by additional depreciation guys additional depreciation means if you are doing certain specified businesses then we will give you something extra as depreciation apart from the original depreciation so obviously higher the depreciation lesser will be your pgbp lesser will be your taxes let me repeat higher the depreciation lesser will be your pgbp lesser will be your taxes so guys we want higher depreciation we want additional depreciation and that additional depreciation is eligible for a deduction and guys that deduction is eligible in form of additional depreciation at the rate of 20 percent on plant and machinery only and only if you specify certain conditions not in every circumstance not in every circumstance so guys the original depreciation on plant and machinery is 15 percent if we add 20% of additional depreciation, it gives me a depreciation of 35% in the first year itself. So additional depreciation is only eligible for the first year when you purchase some new plant and machinery, when some new plant machinery is purchased by you, then additional depreciation is levied only in the first year, in the year of purchase, because uh, you know the government of India wants to motivate young entrepreneurs to buy new machinery, to buy new technology and start their work, start their businesses. So in pursuit of um uh, having more and more uh, 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 you know uh, entrepreneurs leading their way to start their own businesses government of india has started the concept of additional depreciation now business uh, undertaking must have been established on or after 1st of um, april 2005 on or after 1st april 2005 then additional depreciation is available only once in lifetime in the year of purchase of the assets then in case purchases during the year have been put to use for less than 180 days 50 percent of um, uh, the normal rate is eligible so guys before coming on to these um, uh, these miscellaneous these are miscellaneous provisions okay let me first uh, uh, discuss the main provisions which are there okay these are the miscellaneous provisions we'll take up take them separately so it is available to all the assessees engaged in the business of so additional depreciation is available to all the assessees who are eligible who are engaged in the business of manufacture or production of article or thing so the assessees who are engaged in manufacture or production of article or things this depreciation is eligible additional depreciation is eligible for those assessees then those who are involved in generation and transmission or distribution of power so if you are into electricity business then also additional depreciation is eligible to you available on new plant and machinery so if you purchase second hand plant and machinery then additional depreciation is not eligible for you only new plant and machinery if you have then only additional depreciation is eligible acquired and installed after 31st march 2005 so whatever machinery new machinery you have purchased you have acquired and installed those machinery after 31st march 2005 only then this additional depreciation will be eligible to you guys obviously as a businessman i would want additional depreciation so that my profits are reduced so that my taxes are reduced i want additional depreciation then plant and machinery does not include so what plant and machinery are not eligible for uh, additional depreciation if they are not eligible for additional depreciation then obviously original depreciation they will be eligible for okay original depreciation you cannot say that uh, the company is not eligible for original depreciation but additional depreciation plant machinery certain plant machineries are not eligible for additional depreciation so plant machinery does not include ships aircrafts appliances road vehicles 
ऑफिस ट्रांसपोर्ट वहीकल्स प्लांट एंड मशीनरी इंस्टॉल्ड इन प्लांट एंड मशीनरी इंस्टॉल्ड इन रेजिडेंशियल अकोमोडेशन इन ऑफिस प्रमाइसिस they are not eligible for additional depreciation if plant machinery is established or uh, installed in guest house they are not eligible for additional depreciation so additional depreciation will not be eligible for these plant machinery which are installed in these areas then if the plant machinery is second hand then that is also not um, uh, eligible for deduction additional depreciation then plant machinery on which 100% deduction has already been claimed so there might be certain plant machinery where you have already claimed special deduction which means that entire amount of capital expenditure has been allowed as a deduction so special expenditure has already been claimed for that plant machinery then additional de depreciation will not be um, uh, allowed for that particular plant machinery so plant machinery on which 100% deduction has already been claimed those plant and machinery are not el eligible for uh, additional depreciation so additional depreciation not eligible for plant machinery which are um uh, uh, not 100% deductible so 100% deduction allowed plant machinery will not be eligible for additional depreciation now we come on to these additional uh, points guys so these additional points are so the first point is that um, uh, the Additional depreciation. Now, the most important point is additional depreciation is also uh, split into two parts. If the asset, the new asset is uh, being purchased and used for less than 180 days, then the additional depreciation will also be split into two parts. 50% will be available in the year of uh, put to use, and 50% uh, will be available in the subsequent year. So, in a nutshell, 20% will not be available in the year of purchase. 20% will be split into two parts. 10% and 10% 10% will be available in the year of put to use 10% in the subsequent year if in the year of put to use the put to use uh, uh, of the plant machinery has been done for less than 180 days then in that case the um, uh, depreciation will be split into two parts okay this was the story of additional depreciation all right now we come on to a very very important topic of our syllabus guys the topic name is slump sale okay the topic name is slum sale and i'm going to discuss this particular topic in great detail in capital gains chapter also this topic is related to capital gains chapter as well as the chapter on uh, pgbp so both these chapter contains this concept called slum sale now guys what do you mean by slum sale slum sale means sale for a lump sum consideration sale of assets for a lump sum consideration i'll give you an example and by example i will make you understand what do you mean by slum sale all right so guys this is a fixed assets details of a particular business okay this is the fixed asset details of a particular business please see this chart this chart okay x limited has got two units three units unit a unit b unit c x limited has got three units unit a unit b unit c x limited has three block of assets machinery building furniture okay unit a has two machinery unit a has one building unit a has four furniture unit b has two machinery unit b has one building unit b has three furniture okay i've given numbering to the individual assets which are there in a particular unit unit c has one machinery unit c has two buildings you had unit c has four furniture now suppose unit b is getting sold suppose unit b is getting sold for a lump sum consideration of 16 lakh rupees unit c is getting sold for a lump sum consideration of 16 lakh rupees unit c unit b is getting sold unit b is being sold for a lump sum consideration of 16 lakh rupees we are selling off unit b lump sum consideration is being received 16 lakh rupees is received for all the assets for all the assets now the problem is we have not allocated this sales proceed amongst individual assets we don't know how much have we sold m3 for we don't know how much have we sold m4 uh, uh, sold m4 m3 m4 for we don't know how much have we sold b2 for we don't know how much have we sold f5 and f6 for we don't know the individual sales consideration of each of the asset sir why do you want to know the individual sales consideration of each of the asset why do you want to know 
why can't we be okay with the total sales consideration which is 16 lakh 16 lakh is the uh, total sales consideration of unit b why do you want to know individual uh, sales consideration guys i want to know the individual sales consideration why because i've already told you while computing depreciation i need to reduce the sales consideration in my fixed asset register so this is a fixed asset register of this particular entity x limited please see this register this contains the individual assets the individual blocks at the top then there are assets m1 to m5 m b1 to b4 f1 to f11 there are assets which are there in each of the blocks opening wdv is given sales consideration of assets sold individually if the asset is sold individually i have no problem i will uh, reduce this particular um, uh, uh, block from the individual sales consideration that is not a problem but guys when the asset are sold on a lump sum basis then 16 lakh rupees is derived from this entire entire section right now my problem is that i cannot reduce 16 lakh from the entire three columns i need an individual figure for column one i need an individual figure for column two i need an individual figure for column three i need individual figures for all these columns i do not have individual figures i have only one lump sum figure which is 16 lakh now you tell me whether 16 lakh will be reduced from machinery whether 16 lakh should be reduced from building whether 16 lakh should be reduced from furniture what should i do i am in a problem i need to reduce this 16 lakh how can i split this 16 lakh into three parts i am unable to do it i have a problem over here i am unable to do it so if you are unable to do it then what does income tax act tells you income tax act says okay for the assets which are sold as a lump sum consideration for the assets which are sold as a lump sum consideration you reduce wdv of those assets which are sold for lump sum consideration whatever is the wdv of that particular asset you should sold for um you should uh, reduce it over here so what do you mean by that so we didn't understand i'll make you understand okay i'll make you understand please see this okay so guys we are selling m3 and m4 we don't know the individual sales proceed of M3 and M4, but we are selling M3 and M4. I don't know what is the individual sales consideration of M3 and M4. I don't know that because the total consideration is given to me, which is 16 lakh. I don't know what is the consideration for M3 and M4. I don't know that. Income tax act says, okay. Do you know the purchase price of these two assets? We say, of course, yes. We have purchased this four years back. We know the purchase price of these two assets. Suppose the purchase price of these two assets suppose the purchase price of these two assets is two lakh rupees the purchase price of these two assets is suppose two lakh rupees suppose the purchase price of these two assets is two lakh rupees now income tax act asks you to reduce the depreciation which would have been leviable on these two assets if they were a different block altogether so which means that suppose this is a machinery block okay and in the machinery block guys uh, the depreciation which is to be charged is 15 percent okay so 15 percent is charged on this particular asset on a wdv basis so i'll get my calculator okay so 2 lakh rupees is the purchase price minus 15 percent 1 lakh 70 thousand minus 15 percent 1 lakh 44 thousand 500 is the wdv <clears throat> notional WDV. 1,44,500 is the notional WDV. So Income Tax Act is telling you that, okay, in case of lump sum consideration, in case of slum sale, you reduce the WDV of the assets sold on slum sale because we do not know the sales consideration of these individual assets. So the Income Tax Act is giving us a shortcut. You can reduce the WDV of the individual assets and compute your um, uh, uh, amount of depreciation using that WDV. So WDV is the amount which we will reduce from each of these um, blocks. Instead of sales consideration, if the assets were sold individually, then obviously we, we would have reduced the sales consideration. But in this case, we don't have the sales consideration. So guys, we will reduce the assets which are sold on lump sum basis. Their WDV is sold. Please read the formula carefully. Original cost of asset minus notional depreciation. Whatever is the original cost of asset, we will reduce the notional depreciation from that original cost of asset and that should be reduced as WDV of the assets which are sold on lump sum basis. This is known as slump sale. A small variation is required to be done. Why? Because we do not know the individual prices 
of each of the asset in case of slum sale so a small um uh, small difference is there in computation of the depreciation as per the slum sale so this is the concept of slum sale and yes we are going to deal with this concept again in our chapter on capital gains so what a fantastic day to start the pgbp part 2 yes great good morning everyone all right so guys pgbp as i have told in the earlier lectures pgbp is the most important one of the most important chapters of your syllabus and yes not only for intermediate it is important for final as well so cma final has got the entire portion of cma inter pgbp which i am teaching right now the entire portion is applicable for cma final students as well so this particular session is relevant for both cma intermediate students and cma final students of course for cma final students there are some additional concepts which are incorporated in this particular um uh, series which will uh, add on to the intermediate course but yes intermediate course is the basic thing which is applicable for cma final students as well and of course for cma intermediate students this is the most important chapter of your syllabus guys it will hold a good weightage of marks in the examination so yes you need to study this chapter very well its concepts should be really clear in your mind and try to remember the concepts as we move on revise the earlier concepts so that your concepts are fresh in your mind your concepts are clear in your mind that is very very essential for this particular chapter this chapter is pgbp profits and gains of business and profession and in the earlier lectures in the last lecture guys we had studied um depreciation okay one of the most important expenses of our pgbp chapter which is depreciation good morning chirag good morning vivek morya good morning yes isha almost whole uh, revision session is almost for whole cma inter dt almost whole yes i'll be covering until uh, may end i'll be covering almost almost all the chapters of cma inter dt at least all the important chapters okay at least all the important chapter time permits i will do the unimportant chapter as well so uh, depreciation we were talking about depreciation is one of the most important um, uh, topics of our syllabus of pgbp and yes the most important expense of pg head so yes uh, this particular expenditure is um, huge for the capital uh, oriented capital intensive industries like industries where plant and machinery is being used industries where um, uh, sort of uh, heavy machinery heavy building heavy equipments are used over there depreciation is one of the major expenses of those industries even for other industries guys even for non manufacturing sector even for service sector uh, depreciation forms an integral part of their um, uh, books of accounts so yes depreciation was the thing which we had studied in our last class in the last revision lecture if you have not seen pgbp part 1 then please go to uh, the youtube channel and just um, uh, two days back i had uploaded part 1 of pgbp chapter so watch that and then come back to this particular video all right so today we are going to start an important part of the depreciation um, uh, concept and the name of the part is terminal depreciation name of the part is terminal depreciation first of all i'm going to tell you what do you mean by terminal what is the meaning of this this word called terminal okay meaning of this word terminal is end of life terminal word terminal means end of life so whenever the life of a plant and machinery ends that is known as terminal terminal means end of life so terminal depreciation means depreciation which is levied at the end of life of an asset so what is this joke sir this is such a big joke i think um, this is hilarious guys um when the asset is coming to an end then sir why depreciation when the asset is coming to an end then why depreciation there is no point of uh, charging depreciation at the end of the life of the um, uh, of the asset rather depreciation should have been charged during the working life of the asset sir why at the end of the life of the asset yes guys that is the biggest catch in this particular concept called terminal depreciation now before i come on to this concept of terminal depreciation let me introduce you to you one specific kind of business which is power generating unit business these are the business where electricity is being generated these are the years where 
um uh, these are the units these are the companies uh, who are into manufacture of electricity who are into heavy plant and machinery so you know manufacturing of electricity entails heavy plant and machinery there is um, a heavy plant and machinery which is installed to uh, generate electricity so these are the uh, units which are known as power generating units which are responsible for generating electricity heavy uh, plant and machinery is there in this particular sector now government of india has given certain special privileges to power generating units so why would government of india give uh, you know privileges to power generating units guys power generating units are heavy capital intensive um, uh, companies companies where capital is huge capital involvement capital infusion is huge um, this is the characteristic of power generating units so naturally guys um, since a lot of capital infusion is required and returns are also little slow therefore a government has given a huge benefit to power generating units so what is the benefit do you remember in the earlier lecture when we were doing depreciation your hands on the keyboard your hands on the keyboard and i'm going to ask you a question do you remember in the last session we had discussed that depreciation is levied only using one particular method in income tax there's no option of uh, choosing any of the uh, methods like financial accounting in income tax there's only one method which is used for applying depreciation what is that method please write in the chat box i want to know in the last class we had studied what is the method which is employed by the income tax act to compute or to levy depreciation please write in the chat box perfect pankhudi pankaj megha saksham yes guys only wdv is method is allowed only wdv method is allowed slm method is not allowed under income tax act however slm method will yield a higher depreciation okay so it will be beneficial for the assessee because using slm method the depreciation amount will be higher if the depreciation amount is higher uh, the profits will be lower if profits are lower taxes will be lower so according to the income tax act slm method is not always prefer slm method because it will lead to uh, uh, higher profits but according to the income tax act slm method is not permitted slm method is not um, uh, to be chosen by you you can only choose one and only method wdv return down value method that is the typical method which is used under the income tax act for computing depreciation now guys income tax act has carved out one exception during lecture one also i told you there is only one exception to this golden rule that wdv method is employed and the exception is for power generating units for power generating units government of india gives you an option you means power generating unit an option they can either choose wdv on block of asset method or they can choose slm method straight line method for computing their depreciation this is an option which is given to only one kind of business which is power generating unit no other business has this option all other businesses have to mandatorily follow wdv method only power generating unit has um, uh, the option to follow either the wdv method or the slm method either of the two methods are to be followed by the income tax act by the um, uh, assessee so yes naturally guys slm methods yields into a larger depreciation therefore that is much more beneficial for the assessee now there are certain restrictions where while an assessee uses slm method there are certain restrictions restrictions are that assessee who is using slm method cannot have the benefit of additional depreciation guys already government of india is giving you such a big benefit by allowing you depreciation on slm method now additional depreciation is not eligible for the power generating unit this is the condition if you want to use slm additional depreciation is definitely not permissible um, additional depreciation is permissible for the um, uh, assessees who are using wdv on block of asset method so additional depreciation is a benefit which is withdrawn if you use slm method then one benefit is given if you use slm method one benefit is given what is that um, benefit benefit is of terminal depreciation terminal depreciation is the benefit which is given if the uh, additional depreciation benefit is withdrawn <clears throat> so if you withdraw additional depreciation if you do not claim additional depreciation you will be eligible for terminal depreciation so this is the background of this concept called the terminal depreciation who is eligible for terminal depreciation only and only power generating units who have made a choice 
to get their depreciation done by SLM method, they are eligible to um, uh, you know charge the depreciation using the terminal depreciation method. That is the bottom line. That is the crux of the matter. Okay, sir. Got this entire concept now, sir. We need to understand what do you mean by terminal depreciation. What do you mean by terminal depreciation, sir? That is what we want to know. Okay, so before coming to this complex formula, so you can see this complex formula, which is written on the board. And uh, yes, uh, many of you might think that, sir, uh, ratta marna padega. We need to mug up this complex formula. No, no, guys. Before coming to this complex formula, I'm going to write an example to un make you understand what is terminal depreciation. And then I'm going to come to the formula uh, by understanding the concept. You might not be required to mug up the formula. Mugging up will not be required. Okay. So guys, I purchased, let me use a different color ink so that you are able to distinguish. Okay. I purchased a machinery for rupees 9 lakhs. Suppose depreciation which is eligible on this particular machinery is at the rate of 15%. Depreciation which is eligible on this machinery is at the rate of 15%. So 9 lakh rupees multiplied by 15%, I am eligible for depreciation of 1 lakh 35,000. So the WDV at the end of the year, which is remaining of this particular machinery is 7 lakh 65,000. This is the WDV which remains at the end of the year. So 9 lakh minus 15%, 7 lakh 65,000 is the WDV. Now, this is the only asset in the block. Okay, there is no other asset in the block. This is the only asset in the block. In the second year, in the second year, I sold this machinery and the sales consideration which was fetched by me, the sales consideration which was fetched by me, suppose is 2 lakh rupees. I sold this machinery for 2 lakh rupees. So I had incurred a capital loss of 5 lakh 65,000 rupees. I incurred a capital loss. Uh, 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 board is not clear. Some students are saying board is not clear. Just refresh. Guys, just refresh your uh, screens. Maybe refresh, ref, uh, uh, you know, if you refresh your screen, maybe then you will be able to clearly see the board. Please refresh your screen. Guys, the connection is good. From my end, the connection is good. Connection is not a problem. Okay, so what I'll do is I will share these notes on the WhatsApp group. So you can see the notes while you are um, uh, while you are looking at the videos. So you'll be able to uh, accomplish it. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. Let's continue. See, the connection is stable from my side. Connection is not a problem from my side. Okay, okay. So the loss is 5,65,000. The loss which have been incurred on sale of this particular machinery is 5,65,000. Now, this loss of 5,65,000 is definitely a capital loss. This is a capital loss. Guys, this capital loss will not be allowed as a deduction. This is a capital loss. Please look at this. Uh, equation which I have um, uh, made, the competition which I have made. Please look at this on the board. So, I had purchased a machinery for rupees 9 lakhs. I had purchased a machinery for rupees 9 lakhs. Depreciation is 15%. WDV, which is remaining, is 7,65,000. Sales consideration, which is fetched by selling this machinery, is rupees 2 lakhs. So, 5,65,000 is the loss that I have incurred. Now, guys, this loss is in the nature of capital loss. This is in the nature of capital loss. Now, guys, this particular capital loss is definitely not allowable under PGBP. Remember, question number one, illustration number one, I had asked all of you to do illustration number one of the study mat of the CMA Institute. So you had to do study mat of the CMA Institute. You had to um, uh, do that particular question. And that, in that particular question, there was a case where the block was not there. So this is an individual machinery, only machinery in the block. 
when we sell this machinery and we, if we sell it at a loss, then it will not be allowed as a deduction under PGBP. But guys, for the power generating unit, this is a special privilege which is granted to power generating unit. What is the privilege? Privilege is that for power generating unit, this loss will be allowed as an expenditure under the head PGBP. This loss of 5,60,000, will be allowed as an expenditure as PGBP. What a good benefit. What a great benefit, guys. Our PGBP income will reduce to the extent of 5,65,000 and our profits will be lower and our, um, our taxes will be lower. So this is a huge benefit which is granted to the power generating unit. So this is the benefit which is granted to power generating unit. And this benefit is known as terminal depreciation. This benefit is known as terminal depreciation. This benefit is only available to power generating units and no other um, entity is this um, uh, benefit available. This benefit is known as terminal depreciation. Terminal depreciation, one of the most important uh, concepts of your syllabus, which is actually related to power generating. unit. Now, I hope you understood this particular um, uh, computation and you understood what is the meaning of terminal depreciation. Now, the question is, sir, what if, what if our asset was not sold at 2 lakh rupees, but it was sold at a higher price? Yes, guys, there might be a situation where our asset is sold at a higher price, which means the asset is sold for 8 lakh rupees. Please see on the board. The asset is sold for 8 lakh rupees and not um, uh, 5 lakh rupees. The asset is sold for 8 lakh rupees. So 7 lakh 65,000 minus 8 lakh rupees. It comes to 35,000. So 35,000 is the income which is accrued on sale of this particular uh, machinery. This is actually the income. Now guys, if it is an income, if it is an income, just like expense was treated as an deduction from PGBP, income will be chargeable to tax as PGBP. You will um, tax this particular income as PGBP and you will offer it to tax. This income will be offered to tax. So if you sell your uh, machinery at a higher rate and which machinery? Only that machinery which is used in your power generating unit, which is PGU. If you sell it at a higher uh, price, then that particular machinery will fetch an income. The income will be to the extent of 35,000 rupees. And guys, that particular income is the income which you accrue and that income will be taxable as PGBP. Any expense will be taxable as, uh, any expense will be deducted as an expense in PGBP. Income will be taxable as um, income from PGBP. That is the benefit which is uh, given to you. Otherwise, otherwise, apart from PGUs, if any terminal depreciation arises, it is not allowed as a reduction under PGBP. Your profits are not reduced. But this is the benefit which is given under the regime of um, uh, PGUs under the regime of terminal depreciation. Now, guys, the third scenario. Let us come on to the third scenario. So what is the third scenario? Third scenario is that you are gaining, you are selling that machinery for 9,50,000. For 9,50,000, you are selling the machinery. You are selling the machinery for even a higher price than your cost. Guys, this can be a situation. You know, sometimes when you purchase a machinery, immediately after you purchase the machinery, the prices go up. This can be a probable uh, situation. There is, a, there is a situation that the asset prices go up. So you sold that particular machinery at 9,50,000 and your cost was 9 lakh. So your hands on the keyboard. I want an answer from you. What is the income which is taxable as PGBP under this particular situation? What is the income which is taxable as PGBP under this particular situation? What is the amount of income which is taxable as PGBP? Amount of income which is taxable as PGBP. I want to know whether your preparation for this chapter is up to the mark or not. Uh, your hands on the keyboard. Please tell me. What is the amount which is taxable as PGBP in this particular case? Amount which is chargeable as PGBP. Vanshi uh, uh, says 50,000. Praveen Pandey says 50 capital gain. No, no, I'm not talking about capital gain. I'm talking about PGBP. Which income is taxable as PGBP? What income will be taxable as PGBP? That is what I'm asking. I'm not talk asking about capital gains, guys. Not about capital gains. Sorry. What is PGBP income? Everyone is writing capital gains. Now, like we are not talking about capital gains. We are talking about PGBP. What is the PGBP? Ravi Gupta, perfect answer. Perfect answer, Ravi Gupta. Very good. Very good. 
So I'll explain this entire concept. Okay, don't wonder, sir. You didn't explain, and you're asking us the question. I was just asking who has prepared this particular part. That is what I'm asking. Yogesh, perfect answer, Yogesh. Okay. So first of all, let me tell you guys what is the total income in this particular case. That is the question that I'm asking you. What is the total income in this particular case? The total income in this particular case is seven lakh sixty-five thousand minus nine lakh rupees. Oh, nine lakh fifty thousand rupees. The total income, the total income which accrues is one lakh eighty-five thousand. Okay, so the total income which is there for this particular uh, businessman, the total income which is there for this particular businessman is one lakh eighty-five thousand. Now, guys, this one lakh eighty-five thousand will be taxable into two parts. Will be taxable into two parts. The portion which you have received over and above the cost, which is fifty thousand, is taxable as capital gains. the portion which is over and above the uh, uh, cost price that you that is taxable as 50000 that is taxable as capital gains and the portion till the time uh, till the cost the portion till the cost which means 765000 is the wdv and 9, 9 lakh was the cost price so 9 lakh minus 7 lakh 65000 this will be taxable as pgbp 1 lakh 35000 is taxable as pgbp 50000 is taxable Lad into two parts. If there's a gain, and the gain is even more than the cost, okay, even more than the cost, you are realizing the sales consideration. Then in that particular case, guys, you will get two incomes: income under the head PGBP and income under the head capital gains. And yes, the income under the head PGBP is known as balancing charge. The name of that particular income is balancing charge. So, guys, now you will be able to understand this formula very well. And now, no mugging up required, no ratification required. you will understand you have already understood by logic and if you have understood by logic then logic is absolutely clear please confirm if the board is better now and of course guys i will send you these entire notes in the whatsapp group so don't worry about that i will send it in the whatsapp group okay oh sunny koshik is here jai mata di sunny koshik sunny koshik this lecture like this lecture is relevant for you as well because it is relevant for cma final students as well all right it's clear perfect perfect guys perfect all right so now the formula will become uh, really easy the formula will not be you will not be required to mug up this particular formula you will just be required to understand this formula now the formula will become very easy because you have already understood the example which i had just given this example is very very important guys now let us read the formula and don't mug up the formula okay no need to mug up the formula So terminal depreciation or balancing charge is equal to WDV of the asset minus sales value of the asset. So whatever is the WDV, if I reduce sales value from that WDV, that will result into terminal depreciation or balancing charge. If this is a positive number, so guys remember nine lakh minus one lakh thirty five thousand, seven lakh sixty five thousand was the WDV. Okay, so if WDV minus sales value, if it is a positive number, then it will result into terminal depreciation allowable as PGBP. If this is a positive uh, positive number, which means WDV is higher and um, uh, the WDV is higher and um, uh, the sales consideration is lower. If that is the case, then uh, it is positive. Then the entire uh, depreciation is terminal depreciation allowed as a terminal depreciation. If it is a negative figure. Which means that WDV is a lesser amount and sales value is a higher amount. WDV is a lesser amount and sales value is a higher amount. Then, guys, the uh, resulting amount will be balancing charge or capital gains. Balancing charge means negative balance. Um, uh, if if the negative balance is till the extent of accumulated depreciation, that will be taxable as PGBP or business income. And the negative charge, which is beyond the accumulated depreciation, that will be taxable as short term capital gain. so whatever you uh, realize over and above the cost if you realize anything over and above the cost then that particular value is the value which is uh, taxable as short term capital gains that is how we are uh, going to do it okay let's start all right so the formula which i was uh, talking to you about was the formula on terminal depreciation the formula is if wdv minus sales is a positive figure then it will be terminal depreciation only and only in case of 
power generating units if it is a negative balance then up to the extent of accumulated depreciation this will be a business income which is pgbp income and beyond the accumulated depreciation up till the sales consideration so from the cost till the sales consideration it will be short term capital gain that is the bifurcation between the uh, short term capital gain and pgbp income in case of uh, the uh, when the sales consideration is much higher than wdv so that is the concept of terminal depreciation and balancing charge for all of you all right so the next expense which we are going to deal with right now is um the is the concept of change in rates of foreign exchange so if there's a change in rate of foreign exchange currency if there's a change in rate of currency which is there in a particular foreign currency then guys there's an expenditure which is uh, arising out of that also so sir what is this uh, change uh, 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 what is this expenditure first let me explain to you what is this expenditure and then i will come on to the treatment of this particular expenditure so what is this foreign exchange currency difference so the uh, concept is very simple guys suppose you have purchased a particular machinery from a foreign country from a foreign vendor and you have to pay 10000 us dollars to that particular person okay but that person has given you a credit period credit period means you need not pay the purchase consideration the cost in the first year in the first month in the in the month of purchase itself you can pay it after 2 months okay so the uh, seller has given you a credit period of say 2 months you can pay it after 2 months so guys when you had purchased this particular um, uh, you know a service from that particular vendor this is uh, i'm taking example of a service rather than an asset as of now so when you have you can take the example of asset also anything will do so when you had purchased this particular asset or expense then the um, price was 10000 us dollars and at that and at that date the dollars were 4 rupees 70 per dollar rupees 70 per dollar was the rate so the total expense or the total value of this particular um, uh, machinery or expense is 7 lakh rupees for um, uh, this particular person right but when after 2 months when uh, we were required to pay these 10000 dollars to that particular person at that point in time the price of the dollars uh, was a little higher it was 75 rupees so we had to pay 7 lakh 50000 rupees to this particular person and hence there was an enhancement of cost by rupees 50000 that is the that is the uh, uh, additional expenditure which we had incurred due to changes in foreign currency so this additional expenditure which we had incurred due to changes in foreign currency is known as change in rates of exchange of currency so whenever currency rates uh, are changed at that point in time guys we incur certain extra expenditure and this extra expenditure is the expenditure which is on foreign currency um uh, uh, on account of foreign currency fluctuation this expenditure is to be treated in a different manner now 43a section will tell us in what manner will this expenditure be treated so let's start section 43a which deals with rate of exchange of um the changes in rate of exchange of currency section 43a so first of all we are going to talk about capital assets okay so if there are capital assets which you have purchased in foreign currency and you uh i have incurred some exchange difference in that capital um assets which you have purchased from outside then what is the treatment of that particular um uh, foreign exchange difference all right so first of all section 43a is applicable to first of all let's see the applicability applicability is if you have purchased an asset outside india if you have bought an asset outside india if you have bought the asset and forex difference arises on account of payment to foreign vendor or repayment of foreign currency loan so the first condition is that you can um, uh, you have to purchase the asset from outside india you have to purchase the asset from outside india that is the first consideration and which means cumulatively both the situations both the conditions needs to be satisfied secondly the forex difference the foreign exchange difference has to arise on account of either payment to foreign vendor you need to pay to the foreign vendor and due to that payment due to um, a mismatch in the currency rate of um, uh, the date of on the date of payment uh, the payment to foreign vendor will result into a uh, uh, foreign exchange difference or you are paying some foreign currency loan to a foreign bank you have taken a loan from a foreign bank to purchase this asset and 
while repaying that loan of course that loan will be repaid in emis on installment basis and installment um, uh, might accrue after one month two month three month fourth month and so on and guys the foreign exchange rate may differ month on month on month on month so that difference in foreign exchange um, uh, will lead to foreign exchange difference and that is the um, uh, that is the applicability of this particular section so this particular section is applicable on these things so guys my question to you is if i have bought an asset inside india but i have used the foreign currency loan for buying that asset will section 43a apply to me or not let me repeat my question let me repeat my question suppose if i bought the asset from inside india asset has been brought bought from india it is an asset which has been purchased in india and the foreign exchange difference arises on that particular uh, asset which is purchased in india i have taken a foreign currency loan to purchase that asset in india then will this section be applicable to me or not yes or no answer is no 43a will not be applicable why because the machinery or the asset has been purchased in india it has to be purchased outside india to make this particular section applicable on me what is the treatment now let's see what will be the treatment of uh, uh, the foreign exchange difference which arises on capital account if we um, uh, you know repay the uh, foreign exchange um, uh, in, in a different exchange and at a later point in time when block exists when the block of the asset exists then we add it in the block we add the foreign exchange difference in the block like guys in the example my 50000 rupees the foreign exchange was the foreign exchange difference what will i do of this foreign exchange expenditure which i have incurred i will add it to the block and i will claim additional depreciation on it that is the beauty of this particular expense that although this expense takes place at a later point in time but i will be able to claim the depreciation on it i will add it to the block i will add it to the wdv of the block and will claim depreciation on this particular asset if the block exists what if the block ceases to exist what if the block is not there what if the block is um, uh, finished and my foreign exchange uh, uh, difference is still available sir if the block has ceased to exist it means that we have sold off the machinery then sir how will foreign exchange difference still arise because guys loan might still be there on you you might be repaying the loan even after the asset is sold off you might be repaying the loan to the foreign bank and on account of that repayment of loan there might be some foreign exchange difference which might accrue to you that is treated as capital receipt or capital expenditure which means it will not be allowed from pgbp uh, provisions it will not be allowed from pgbp provisions that is the bottom line so two things when block exists has a different connotation when block ceases to exist has a different connotation both the connotations are very different both the treatments are very different from each other so yes this was foreign exchange difference all right one very simple section and one very simple um, uh, you know provision which is there and a very very obvious one guys this is this doesn't need any um, uh, special remembrance it's a very very obvious kind of a session the session is <clears throat> the section is section on depreciation in certain cases there are certain cases on which depreciation is liable is liable in a very different manner okay so depreciation in certain cases so there are three cases where we, which where we will uh, discuss how the depreciation will be levied those three cases are number 1 amalgamation number 2 demerger number 3 succession okay amalgamation means where two companies are coming together and they are forming a new company or one company is getting incorporated in another another company that is known as amalgamation what is demerger demerger means when two divisions there are two divisions of a particular company and one division is um, uh, uh, you know demerged or is is a uh, siphoned off and a new company is created out of that division that is known as demerger third is succession succession means when a proprietary concern gets transferred into a company or when a partnership firm gets um, uh, created into a company or when a uh, you know, uh, a sole proprietorship concern or a company gets converted into LLP. Okay, so to avail benefits of the Income Tax Act, uh, the form of the organization keeps on changing. Companies get transferred into LLP, uh, partnership firms get transferred into companies, etc., etc. Now, guys, one common thing about all these three types of um, uh, change is that depreciation for a certain period of time will be eligible to the predecessor company. and depreciation for the balance time will be avail available to the successor company so in each of the three cases in each of these cases there is a 
predecessor company and there is a successor company where the asset is being transferred so during the year ownership of the asset is transferred from one person to another person that is the uh, bottom line of all these three cases so in these three cases the depreciation will be split into both the organizations based on the number of days the asset was put to use that is the uh, uh, criteria now let us discuss one by one these cases okay number one amalgamation okay so a company is the amalgamating company b is the amalgamated company so a is getting amalgamated to b a is getting amalgamated to me b so depreciation of a asset a's assets depreciation of a's assets will be claimed by both a and b on the basis of number of days will be claimed by both a and b on the basis of number of days the depreciation will be uh, will be split into the two companies next is demerger demerger means a limited gets transferred or a limited um, has two units and it uh, it cuts off one of the unit unit x is cut off to x limited so a limited unit x is cut off to x limited that is the demerger scenario now the question is sir the depreciation which is there for unit x assets should it be claimed by x limited or should it be claimed by the erstwhile a limited answer is both both it will be split into two parts on the basis of number of days used number of days for which this particular asset is used by both of the um, companies on the basis of that it will be split yes guys pro rata pro rata we will divide we will first of all compute the entire depreciation divided by 365 then the number of days for which the unit x was um, with a limited for those days depreciation will be claimed by a limited for those number of days in which unit x was part of x limited uh, depreciation for those days will be claimed by x limited that is how splitting up is done then last case is succession succession means when a company or a firm or something else get in get a uh, transfer into some other type of organization for example a partnership firm get transferred into get converted into a company or a company gets converted into and llp this is known as the predecessor company this is known as the predecessor organization this is known as the successor organization again the depreciation will be split into two parts what is the true two part predecessor company and the successor company depreciation will be split on the basis of number of days the assets are used by both of the companies so guys please note one very important thing in all these three parts guys please note one very important thing there is no problem for the assets of b limited because assets of b limited were with b limited earlier also now also there is no problem with assets of b limited problem is with assets of a limited who will claim depreciation for assets of a limited so the company which is getting diluted or the company which is get, getting extinguished those companies assets are uh, stand a chance of splitting so splitting is to be done for the company which is getting extinguished in our case a limited is getting extinguished if a limited is getting extinguished then guys the um, uh, the depreciation which is eligible for uh, a limited will be split into two parts a limited and b limited that is the um, uh, crux of the matter that is the computation all about so yes this was a very small concept the concept name was um, uh, depreciation in special cases and the special cases are three special cases in our case amalgamation demerger and conversion conversion means a company gets converted into another uh, an organization gets converted into another organization demerger means when one part of the company gets transferred into another part gets converted into another part and amalgamation means when when one company gets merged or amalgamated into another company those are the three parts so this is the depreciation in special cases okay now we move on to a very important deduction of our syllabus guys deduction in case of special deposit account in case of growing and manufacturing of rubber coffee and tea section 33 ab section 33 ab deals with manufacturer and grower of rubber coffee and tea so guys special privileges are granted to uh, coffee growers tea growers and rubber growers because these three industries the indian government wants to protect these three industries um, in a financial way also therefore some benefits are given to um, uh, the tea growers rubber growers and coffee growers so this section has been specially introduced for tea rubber and coffee section 33 a b deduction for special deposit account now guys please tell me one thing please tell me one thing i am earning money from my tuitions okay i provide coaching to you i provide mentorship i provide guidance to all my students i am 
um, earning income from that particular uh, source of income. Okay. Now I pay salaries to my staff. Please tell me whether it is an expense for me, whether it is a allowable expense for me or not. Please write in the chat box. I am paying expense to my staff. If I am paying expense to my staff, then um, uh, would uh, that expense be uh, treated as uh, a deduction from my PGBP? Jyotish, concept of 50% of depreciation would not arise in case of forex loss. No, it will not arise because put to use has been done earlier uh, itself. All right. So I am paying employee salary to my employees. Will it be allowed as a deduction? I am paying salary to my employees. Will it be allowed as a deduction to me? Yes, it is allowable. Perfect, guys. Everyone is saying yes. Only Pankaj is saying no. I don't know why Pankaj is saying no. But yes, it is an allowable expenditure. Yes, it is an allowable expenditure. Now, guys, now. Perfect, perfect. This is an expenditure. Very good. Vishakha, Tanisha, Devadatta, Aditi, Sabita, Jyotesh, Pankhudi. Very good, very good. Yashika, Jyotwani. Very good. Question number two. <clears throat> Out of my earnings, I deposit some of the earnings into a fixed deposit. I save it for my future. I'm a prudent person. I want to save something for my future. I deposit something in the fixed deposit. Will it be allowed as my expenditure or not in my profit and loss account? That is my question. Yes or no. I save something for my future. Out of my earnings, I do some fixed deposit and deposit it in bank. I save it for future. I save it for future. Will it be allowed as a deduction? This time, will it be allowed as a deduction or not? Please answer in the chat box. Let's see. If it is allowed as a deduction or not. Rishab says not. Perfect. Sarneka says not. Tanisha, Kirti, Ravi, Sabita, Vanshi, Rajan, Aditi Kumari, Ravi Gupta, Pankaj. Very good. Nishan Prajapati. No. Absolutely no. <clears throat> Yogesh. No. Tirtesh. No. Very good, guys. Answer is no. It is not allowed as a deduction. But, guys, the special thing is that in case of tea, rubber, and coffee, this deposit is allowed as a deduction. So you will be asking me, so what is so special about this reduction? The speciality about this reduction is that even when expenditure is not being incurred, but a fixed deposit is being created, even then the expenditure is being allowed. Even then the expenditure is being allowed. This is the crux of this particular entire concept. Yes, there are certain restrictions on utilizing this deposit. At a later point in time, you have to utilize this deposit for a particular purpose only. There are certain restrictions um, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, required to be fulfilled. That is very true. But still, fixed deposit is allowed as a deduction. So this fixed deposit which is allowed as a deduction is um, the crux of this particular uh, deduction. This is the special deduction for special deposit account. This is special deduction for special deposit account. Guys, just give me two minutes. Okay, so let's see what are the conditions which is which are to be fulfilled uh, to claim this particular deduction, which is deduction for special deposit account, section 33 AB, rule 5 AC. So it is applicable to all the SSEs who are into the business of growing and manufacturing. So two things are there growing and manufacturing, tea, coffee, rubber. So if these three things are being grown and manufactured by an SSE, then guys. Um, uh, the, the deduction will be available to that particular person. Now, what is the quantum of deduction? What is the amount of it? Before that, uh, where should this deposit be done? This deposit should be done to NABARD. NABARD is the uh, bank, agricultural bank. Uh, uh, so, this deposit is to, is to be done in NABARD within six months or due date of furnishing of the return of income. So, the deposit is to be done with NABARD. The deposit is to be created with NABARD. Uh, from the profits which are earned from uh, growing and manufacturing tea, rubber or coffee, the deposits are to be done with NABARD. What is the quantum of reduction? How much deduction will be allowed? 40% of PGBP will be allowed as a reduction or amount deposited, whichever is lower. Okay, So amount which is deposited or 
40 percent of the pgbp whichever is lower that is the quantum of deduction then what is the permissible withdrawal so if you want to withdraw this money then uh, what is the permissible withdrawn if you want to withdraw this money then guys you can only utilize this money for specified purposes yes you can withdraw this money but after withdrawing this money you have to um, use this money for specified purposes specified purposes are the purposes like which are related to your tea coffee rubber business those are the specified purposes so withdrawn will be permitted for specified pur purposes only in case of closure of business the withdrawn will be permitted if your business is, uh, ceases to exist if it doesn't um uh, uh, you know uh, carry on anymore then closure dissolution fully taxable death of the partner partition of the partner or liquidation it is not taxable so closure of business withdrawal is permissible but it will be taxable if you withdraw in normal circumstances it will not be taxable if you withdraw in abnormal or certain typical circumstances lock in period lock in period yes there is a lock in period for the deposit which you are doing lock in period is 8 years lock in period is not applicable in case sale to government or local authority succession of the firm to a company so lock in period is there guys lock in period means suppose you withdraw that particular amount okay and you employ it in specified purpose suppose specified purposes you can purchase machinery from this particular withdrawal okay if you can purchase machinery from this particular withdrawal then specified pur purposes uh, the purchase of that machinery okay but that machinery is to be kept with you for at least 8 years you cannot sell that machinery for at least 8 years so whatever withdrawn is done and whatever specified purpose is that particular fund employed into that is to be logged in for 8 years but yes lock in period is not applicable you can um, uh, you know uh, make use of that particular uh, fund for some other use also if you are uh, selling selling it to government or local authority and succession of a firm to a company if you are um, uh, 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 making your sales to government authority or local authority and uh, the uh, the the uh, the withdrawn is being done on succession of a firm to a company when you are um, uh, withdrawing the money for succession of the firm to a company so earlier you were a firm now you are a company so for that particular purpose you have withdrawn the money and you have again made the deposit that withdrawal will not be called as withdrawal that will not be uh, called as breach of the lock in period now what is the taxable income in these three cases what is the taxable income uh, that is computed uh, so again guys just like presumptive taxation this is also kind of a presumptive taxation where the uh, income is presumed so for tea manufacturer and grower the income is pre presumed at 40% for coffee manufacturer and grower the uh, income is presumed at 25% and 40% so why this difference of 25 and 40 the difference is because if you are just growing coffee then your income will be presumed to be 25% if you are after growing curing the coffee also or processing the coffee also then your income will be uh, assumed to be 30% then rubber your income will be uh, uh, assumed to be 35% so as whatever is your business income first we will reduce the amount of 40% from that business income first we will reduce the total amount of 40% from that business income and then we are going to multiply it with the respective presumptive um, income rates and calculate the taxable income that is how taxable income is to be computed in case of tea rubber and coffee uh, uh, grower and manufacturer so this is section 40 uh 33 a b which is in case of three special businesses the businesses are tea coffee and rubber okay site restoration front is a very very easy uh concept that you can do yourself i will share the notes with you okay and yes guys before we proceed further please hit a like button please hit a thumbs up button so that uh you know i also feel motivated by um uh, this gesture of yours so if you are liking the session please hit a thumbs up all right next section which we are going to study is scientific research expenditure scientific research expenditure section 35 scientific research expenditure section 35 this is the next section which we are going to study now now guys if you spend some money for researching for doing some scientific research then government of india gives you special deductions and special privileges why because government of india will always want you to um, uh, you know find out something new which will benefit the economy of the country government of india will always want you to uh, find something new create something new have some creativity in you they will always want this so they will give you certain additional benefit if you um, uh, you know employ your expenses in um, uh, uh, producing something new or researching something new 
so that is why research and uh, development expenditure is critical just a second guys okay yes research and uh, development expenditure is a special expenditure which is allowed when you or your company uh, gets self, itself employed in uh, in house research or research through outside association whenever you spend some money in doing some research on your existing product or some new product then guys uh, scientific research expenditure is allowed as a deduction so there are two scenarios which are there the research which is done in house research which means you in your company have developed a research center you have some scientists with you you have developed some research center in your company and in your company inside your company you are um, doing some in house research that is your in house research okay then second is research through outside association so if you have done some research work not by yourself you are not in your company um, uh, you know researching or uh, finding about something you are um hiring some third party or donating in some third party who are doing research on your behalf so in both the situation deduction will be allowed now what is the quantum of deduction that is the uh, uh, point of consideration all right so if the research is being done after commencement of business or if the research is being done before commencement of business there are two scenarios okay after commencing of business you are doing the research or before commencing of the business you are doing your research there are two scenarios which are applicable if after commencement of business you are doing the research then 100% of both revenue and capital expenditure will be allowed as a deduction now this is the big thing guys this is the big thing what is the big thing big thing is revenue expenditure is usually always allowed as a expenditure there's no problem in allowing revenue uh, expenditure as an expenditure but the key point is the special thing is that in this particular case capital expenditure is also allowed as a deduction capital expenditure is also allowed as a deduction otherwise guys capital expenditure would um, uh, usually be uh, you know uh, treated as your asset and depreciation will be allowed on it usually but in this particular case capital expenditure is also allowed as a deduction and that to 100% that to 100% so the entire capital expenditure which you have incurred the entire revenue expenditure which you have incurred that is debited to profit and loss account to compute the profit that is the beauty of this section that is the benefit of this particular section which is um uh, 35 which is on in house research this is on in house research okay sir next is before commencement of business if your uh, research and development happens before commencement of business your business has not commenced as yet and before commencement of business your um, uh, uh, you know there is some research and development which is taking place in your um, organization then for 3 years before your business commencement of business for last 3 years before you commence your business your expenditure will be allowed revenue expenditure as well as capital expenditure will be allowed now the um, revenue expenditure which will be allowed is not entire revenue expenditure it will only be two types of expenditure number one salary excluding perquisites paid to employees so all the salaries which are paid to employees who are uh, doing some research work for you all the salary expenditure will be allowed as a reduction and raw material expenditure will be allowed as a reduction which is uh, uh, which is used for your business of um, uh, research so in researching whatever um, uh, expenditure is being used that is the uh, expenditure which is allowed so raw material and salary is allowed as an expenditure raw material and salary is allowed as an expenditure so only two expenditures are allowed as an expenditure raw material and salary guys this particular expenditure is allowed as a deduction now capital expense is also allowed as a deduction but capital expense expenses is allowed um, uh, for last three years except for land land is not allowed as a reduction land will not be allowed as a reduction but other than land all other capital expenditure will be allowed as a deduction then next is what if the research takes place through outside association which means we are not um, uh, you know incurring some research expenditure in our own organization we are donating some money which are belonging to us uh, 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 for research to some other organization what if that happens okay so research through outside association research which is not being conducted in house which is not being conducted by the company which is not being conducted by the uh, business it is not being conducted by the business 
what will happen in that case guys in that case 100% of the amount paid to that particular association will be allowed as a reduction but the research should be of specific nature this particular column will tell you what kind of research is eligible for uh, deduction now if you pay to national laboratory university iit if you pay to any of these three organizations then scientific research will be allowed as a deduction only scientific research is allowed as a deduction if you pay for, pay for scientific research that will be allowed as a reduction if you uh, pay to any research association university or college then both scientific research and social science research will be allowed as a reduction if you pay to some indian company for doing some research then scientific research will be allowed as a deduction so you have to specify the purpose also for which you are donating if your purpose is not related to purpose which is written over here then deduction is not allowed suppose if i pay to some company to do some research on say taxation will it be allowed or not please write in the comment box please write in the comment box will it be allowed or not i will pay to some company to research on some taxation principles tax will it be allowed or not please write in the comment box will section 35 be applicable to me no it will not be applicable to me himani is absolutely right no the person can uh, uh, oh yes jyotish rani pankaj sabita very good very good answer guys so you have to make sure that the purposes for which the uh, the payment is being done are these purposes only <laughs> now the last provision of this section is guys in case last 3 years businesses in case last 3 years expenses are being claimed last 3 years expenses are being claimed then 100% of the expenditure incurred in past 3 years prior to uh, uh, the commencement of business should be allowed as a deduction so this is the uh, uh, section which we are dealing with section 35 all right then sale of assets um, the assets which are used for scientific research if we sell off those assets okay and they uh, uh, you know get get a some gain or get a some loss then what will be the treatment of that loss and gain which we derive from selling of the assets so sale of assets used in scientific research so assets which are sold um, uh, right now they are used for scientific research then what will happen what will be the treatment of that particular sale of asset so asset is sold without using any other purpose and asset is sold after being used for some other purpose these are the two scenarios which can happen okay now uh, sometimes what happens is after the research work ends then that particular asset is shifted to the normal business uh, working okay so for example i bought a super computer for doing research okay uh, after the research was over i transferred that super computer to my normal business i transferred it to my normal business my normal business was um uh, uh, was being conducted using that uh, super uh, computer now when we transfer our asset for normal business from scientific research business then guys there's a different treatment but if we sell the uh, sell the product uh, without sell the asset without using for any the purpose then the treatment is different so there are two different treatments which are prescribed in the act so treatment number 1 when without using for any other purpose you sell the asset then sales consideration to the extent of cost of asset is treated as pgbp and sales consideration over and above the cost of asset is treated as capital gains so whatever is the sale of asset so suppose if, if you had purchased the uh, the uh, machinery for 10 lakh rupees okay you used it for research scientific research okay obviously you would have claimed the Uh, expenditure on on that particular uh, machinery 100% will be allowed as a deduction okay now this was the cost now selling price is suppose 12 lakh rupees selling price is suppose 12 lakh rupees there is a gain of 2 lakh rupees okay there is a gain of 2 lakh rupees selling price is 12 lakh rupees there is a gain of 2 lakh rupees now what does it say sale consideration to the extent of cost of asset will be treated as pgbp so 10 lakh rupees out of this 12 lakh rupees 10 lakh rupees will be treated as pgbp and out of this 12 lakh rupees 2 lakh rupees will be treated as capital gains 2 lakh rupees will be treated as capital gains 10 lakh rupees will be treated as pgbp so why this 10 lakh is being treated as pgbp so this is uh, not the profit this is the recovery of the main amount yes guys it is recovery of the main amount but remember when this asset was purchased it was 100% allowed as allowed as a deduction when it was 100% allowed, allowed as a deduction then naturally if there is some recovery on this particular account we will also treat it as um uh, income our income so 10 lakh rupees is 
is uh, treated as income PGBP and 2 lakh rupees is treated as capital gains. That is the scenario. Okay, sir. Got it. Sir, what if the asset was used after uh, using it for some other purpose like after using it for normal business? So I had a supercomputer. I had first of all used it for scientific research. Then when the research was over after that point in time, I used it for um, uh, I used it for uh, any other purpose. Any other purpose means I used it for a uh, uh, purpose of my normal business. Then what will happen after being used for any other purpose? Then what happens? Sales consideration to be reduced from the block of asset. So I will reduce the sale consideration from the block of asset because now the asset would have been added to my um, block of asset. So sales consideration will be reduced to my block of asset. Cost of acquisition of such asset is to be taken as nil at the time of conversion of scientific research asset into normal business asset. So I'll give you an example over here. Right. <clears throat> I had an asset worth rupees 10 lakh which was used for scientific research. Okay, this was used for scientific research. After two years, I transferred this asset to my um, uh, business, to my normal business. Okay. When I transferred it to my normal business, then I transferred it at nil value because 100% reduction was already allowed from this 10 lakh while I bought it. The year when I bought it, 100% was allowed as a reduction. So 100% was allowed as a reduction. I transferred it to my business at nil value. Okay. Now it is sold. And after selling it, I got 11 lakh rupees from it. So what will I do? I will, I will subtract this 11 lakh rupees from my block of asset. I will reduce this 11 lakh rupees from my block of asset. That is the treatment which I'm going to do for sale of this particular scientific research, which is now forming part of my business assets. It was earlier scientific research asset. Now it is part of my business asset. <laughs> so since now it is part of my business asset, I will, um, uh, uh, you know, claim it as my uh, uh, normal sales consideration as if my normal business asset has been sold. Similarly, I will uh, reduce the sales consideration from my block of asset. That is the treatment that I'm going to give. All right, sir. Got it. So very simple treatments are there for these uh, uh, cases. And yes, these are important cases which are required to be fulfilled, which are required to be done. All right. Last question. Last section which you're going to do for today. Last section, section 35 AD special businesses, special businesses means what special businesses means if you are entering into certain special businesses, then just like scientific research, we had allowed 100% of the capital expenditure as deduction, right? In scientific research, we had allowed 100% um, as uh, the capital expenditure we had allowed as a reduction, just like that. If you are into uh, certain special businesses, if you are into certain specified businesses, then guys, 100% of the capital expenditure is again allowed as a reduction, a huge benefit which is given to you uh, so that your uh, tax uh, is reduced. Okay. So if you are into any of these businesses, so these are the businesses which are listed in section 35 AD. If you are into any of these businesses, what are these businesses? Cold chain, warehouse business, natural gas, oil, petrol, pipeline, house which is located in slum or affordable scheme. Hospital, which has 100 beds or above. Hotel, two star onwards. Fertilizer, inland container depot. Container, uh, freight station. Honey, bees, uh, honey, which is extracted from bee and uh, uh, wax, which is extracted from bee. Slurry pipeline, semiconductor, infrastructure, heavy infrastructure industry. If you are working into any of these sectors, if you are working into any of these industries, then guys, um, uh, we will allow 100% of the capital expenditure as deduction. Usually capital expenditure is not allowed as a reduction in first year, but we will allow 100% of the capital expenditure in first year itself. That is the beauty of this section. That is the benefit of this section that if you are into these specified businesses, your capital expenditure will be allowed to the extent of 100% in first year itself. There are certain exceptions to this rule. Expenditure which is related to land not allowed as a reduction. Goodwill not allowed as a reduction. Any financial instruments not allowed as a reduction. So if you have made any expenditure with respect to land, it is not allowed as a redu deduction, just like uh, a section 35 guys, 35 also didn't allow land as an um, deduction because land cost is huge and it's a non depreciable asset. We don't usually also give any deduction for land. So special deduction will also not be available for land. Next payment above 10,000 must not be in cash. So while you are purchasing this asset, capital expenditure should not be 
more than 10,000 in cash. If you do any transaction in cash, then this particular deduction will not be applied to you, will not be eligible to you. Business should not be an old business. Machinery should not be a secondhand machinery. Business should not be, um, uh, uh, should not be made by splitting up or reconstruction of existing business. So sometimes what happens is guys, people are very smart. You know, after advent of this section, uh, they knew that they did not had any new business. They were having an old business. But after advent of this section, they would try to restructure their business. Okay. They would try to reconstruct their business so that they fall into this category to take benefit of this particular section. But no, this uh, section doesn't give benefit to the old um, uh, businesses. It only gives benefit to the businesses which are established after a particular period. Okay. So the business which is um, uh, made after splitting up or reconstruction that is not eligible for this deduction and no secondhand machinery is allowed as a deduction. If you are uh, purchasing secondhand machinery, it will not be allowed as a deduction because we will want to initiate capitalization. We want to initiate, um, uh, you know, uh, resource um, uh, capital assets. New capital assets should be created by you. New capital assets should be bought by you. That is the endeavor of government of India behind this particular section. So yes, guys, this is the section. And yes, if you falter in this section, if you do not fulfill the conditions of this section, which means you falter in this section, then um, if you you know purchase uh, the machinery, but you sell it quickly, you sell it very, very quickly, then guys, um, the deduction will be reversed and it will be treated as deemed income. The deduction will be reversed and it will be treated as deemed income. It will be uh, income in your hands. So deduction, which is claimed, less notional depreciation which would have been there if the asset was uh, used in normal business purpose rest will be deemed income in your hands your income will be enhanced by that amount your income will be um, treated as income in your hands so if you sell that machinery very very soon which you have purchased then we will uh, uh, include that in your income this is treated as deemed income let's take an example mr omer khan purchased machinery worth 10 lakh in financial year 15 16 eligible for deduction under section 35 ad in financial year 18 19 so after three years after three years he had transferred this machinery to an ineligible business he transferred this machinery to an ineligible business what is the tax implication so guys in financial year 18 19 the entire deduction will be taxable as income in this particular case entire deduction will be taxable as income in this particular case after uh, the relevant period okay so notional income will be um, uh, deemed income will be accrued in hands of the assessee if miscompliance happens if the miscompliance happens then notional income will be taxable in hands of the assessee okay guys so this was section number 35d all right guys so in the last lecture we had studied our section 35 ad which was on capital expenditure for specified businesses now um, uh, we have started the special deductions guys what are special deductions? Special deductions means deductions which are given um, apart from the uh, usual norms, apart from the usual um, uh, uh, accounting norms. The accounting norms are that only revenue expenditure deserves a, a full set off or full deduction in the year in which they are incurred. Only the revenue expenditure are eligible for a full deduction. But guys, in this case, in certain cases, even the capital expenditure will be allowed as a deduction, complete deduction in year one. These are known as special deductions and special deductions are what we are going to discuss um, uh, in these lectures. And yes, in the last session, guys, we had studied about various special deductions. Like one of the special deductions was the deduction on capital expenditure for specified businesses. Then we had studied a deduction on um, scientific research expenditure. All these deductions are special deductions. Why even the capital expenditure is allowed as a deduction in year one. In the very first year, the capital expenditure is also allowed as a deduction. And that is why these are known as special deductions. And last uh, class, we had completed this 35 AD deduction. <clears throat> All right. Now, in this particular class, we are going to start the next special deduction, amortization of the telecom license fees. Now, first of all, please understand this expenditure called the telecom license fees. So guys, the telecom operators who operate telecom um, uh, business, the telephony business like Vodafone, Bharti, Airtel, Idea, uh, Geo, all these telephone uh, operators, telephony uh, services operators, these are required to get a special license from TRI to operate in a particular region. TRI is the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. They have to take some permission. They have to pay some 
fees which is known as the telecom license fees they have to take licenses pay the fees and then only can they provide telephony services in a particular area after getting regulated after getting due recognition and license from the respective um, uh, authorities they are permitted to uh, uh, continue their business in that particular area so it is a highly regulated business uh, it's not that anyone and everyone can start his telecom business uh, it is a highly regulated business in india and this business requires a license fee to be paid now naturally guys license fee is a huge amount which is paid at the uh, starting and it remains valid for a couple of years for for a few years it remains valid um, uh, so this particular license fee um, is required to be deducted from the pgbp profits and gains of in business and profession it is required to be deducted from pgbp and that deduction is uh, regulated by section 35 abb so the conditions are that expenditure is incurred and paid so telecom license fee deduction is only eligible if it is paid so it is not only uh, when it is incurred but when it is paid it is allowed as a deduction so if you have telecom uh, license fee which is not paid then it is not allowed as a deduction payment is a necessary factor to allow this as a deduction allowed in equal installments over a period of license so whatever is the period of license which means the license says valid till 10 years or license is valid till 20 years then over the period of license you will amortize this fees equally just like straight line uh, method <clears throat> just like normal amortization which we do of intangible assets so the amount is allowed the license fees is allowed over the um, period of license in equal installments i'll give you an example suppose if 50 lakh worth of amount uh, license fees is paid 50 lakh worth of license fees is paid and the uh, tenure of license is say 10 years okay so 5 lakh per year will be allowed as a deduction this is the principle which is stated over here then subsequently it says sometimes what happens is fees is paid before commencement of business so even when the business has not commenced even before the business has commenced the fees is required to be paid so when the businessman is in the process of establishing its business at that point in time it has to pay fees in advance to the, uh, the to the regulatory authority and at that point in time you know business is not up and running so there's no income when there's no income uh, there's no question of deduction okay so before commencement of business if the fees is paid then the deduction starts from the year when the business commences so here when the business commences the deduction will start so deduction starts from commencement of the year so uh, you know say you have uh, paid your uh, license fee in 2022 but your business starts from 2024 so from 2022 say for five years your um, uh, license fee is granted let me take this example in writing okay so suppose you had paid the license fee of five lakh rupees in 2022 okay <clears throat> you have paid the license fee in 2022 uh, of five lakh rupees this license fee is valid for five years okay this license fees is valid for five years now you commenced your business in 2024 you commence your business in 2024 and let's presume the dates to be first january of each of the year okay first january of the each of the year so you commence you commence your business on first january 2024 you had obtained the license on first january 2022 you had paid 5 lakh rupees uh, which should have been amortized over a period of 5 years right uh, but unfortunately due to some reasons your business commenced from 2024 now in the chat box i want to know in the chat box i want to know your hands in the chat box after 2024 for how many years for how many years will the amortization take place after 2024 for how many years will the amortization took place take place the uh, the life useful life of the uh, licenses the tenure of the license is five years so after commencement of business because it says that commencement uh, after commencement deduction to start from commencement okay so reduction will start from commencement but for how many years will the deduction be um, uh, there that is the question all right other says three years nandini says three years yashika says five years zenab says three years jyotish says three years dipika says three years nandini says three years om ditesh five years <clears throat> most of you are right most of you are right the deduction will continue for three years because guys the license is valid for a period of five years and five years will start from 2022 and they will end in 2026 
So 31st December 2026, this uh, license is going to expire. This license is going to expire in 31st Dece on 31st December 2026, right? So the license has to be amortized in 2024. 2025 and 2026 so three years will be allowed to amortize this particular license so five lakh rupees divided by three is the per year um, uh, deduction which will be allowed to be claimed the deduction cannot exceed beyond the expiry date of the license expiry date is 31st december 2026 the uh, amortization cannot exceed the uh, uh, expiry um, uh, the uh, expiry of the license date amortization cannot exceed beyond this particular date that is the principle and therefore the deduction starts from commencement of the um, uh, business fee paid after commencement of the business deduction starts from the payment year itself whenever the amount is paid to the regulatory authority from that year guys the deduction starts okay so there's no uh, difficulty in the second part okay sir got it <coughs> Let's move on to our next deduction and the next deduction is yes one of the very important discussions one of the very very important deductions of your syllabus guys section 35 D preliminary expenses one of the very important deductions of your syllabus one of the very important topics of your syllabus PGBP amortization of preliminary expenses one of the very important topics of your syllabus uh, from an exam standpoint also it's very very important uh, it can also come as an independent question guys it can also be clubbed with the entire full-fledged pgbp question it can also come as an independent question anything can happen with this particular um, section so amortization of preliminary expenses preliminary expenses is section 35 d all right <clears throat> now what do you mean by preliminary expenses? First, we need to understand this. Only then would we be able to um, uh, appreciate why a special deduction for it. Sir, why can't it just be treated as business expense and allowed under section 37? Why, why are we doing a special section for it? So what is the need of discussing it separately? Why its, it's nature is so special that we need to discuss it separately? So before answering all those questions, we need to understand what do you mean by preliminary expenses? First of all, I'll make you understand the word preliminary. Okay, preliminary. The, the meaning of the word preliminary is pre preparatory. Preparatory. So while we are preparing for something, the expenditure which we incur, while we are preparing for something, that is known as preliminary expenditure. When we are preparing for something, if we, uh, we are uh, incurring some expenditure on preparation of something, that is known as preliminary expenditure. Guys, when we are establishing our organization, when we are establishing our company, when we are establishing our business, there are certain expenses which are incurred <coughs> even before the business is established. And that is known as preliminary or preparatory business. It is known as preparatory business. The business which we are preparing, which we are preparing. That business is known as preparatory expenses or preliminary expenses section 35D. Now, why a separate section for it? Why are we studying a separate um, uh, uh, provision for it? Because the expenditure has been incurred before the business has started. So actually, business is not started as yet and the expenditure is incurred before the business has started. And why uh, have we incurred such an expenditure? Because business uh, uh, starting of formalities are required to be done. But the mood point of consideration is, guys, this expenditure is not relevant for running the business. This is not relevant for running the business. It is relevant only and only for starting the business. That is the mood point of difference between any other expenditure and this expenditure. So this expenditure is not incurred for running of the business. It is incurred for starting of the business. So Income Tax Act can say that. This particular expenditure is not deductible at all. Why? Because it is not uh, incurred for running the business. You have not um, uh, continued your business or you have not, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, carried on your business using this particular expenditure. This expenditure has been incurred before setting up the business. What if the business is not set up? Then also this uh, expenditure is a sunk cost, is a lost cost. Plus the matching concept. What do you mean by matching concept? Revenues and expenses are to be matched with each other. Only when revenues are occurred, 
then the expense is allowed to be deducted. That is the matching concept which we always study in our accountancy, and um, you know that impacts our books of accounts. So from both of these angles, this expenditure uh, uh, find a little. Uh, it it is found a little out of place, you know. because it is not incurred for running the business and plus it doesn't even contribute to um uh, you know earning revenue directly we cannot say that this um, uh, this expenditure has uh, helped us in earning revenue because there might be a situation where company is incorporated and there is no revenue at all there there are those situations as well so a special provision was drafted to allow preliminary expenses um in the books of accounts as per the income tax act and therefore these particular expenses are Especially dealt with under Section Thirty Five D. So first of all, let's discuss what do you mean by preliminary expenses. So guys, preliminary expenses means preparation of reports. So before you commence your business, you prepare certain reports to ascertain whether the business will be profitable or not. So for preparation of these reports, there are certain professionals which are hired, and there are um, uh, charges which are to be paid to those professionals. That is known as preparation of reports. What kind of reports are there? Project reports are there, and feasibility reports are there. Feasibility means what? Feasibility means um, uh, validity. Feasibility means whether the business will be a success or not. This is known as feasibility report. And project report means um, uh, the project which is being carried on, the project which has been continued. That particular project is um, uh, is 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 <coughs> valid or not? That particular project will go through or not? So all these things are written in the project report. So project report and feasibility report. These are two kinds of reports which are. there in um uh, in 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 this particular expenditure preliminary expenditure and both these expenses are incurred before the business is commenced okay before the business starts both these expenses are incurred now conducting market survey this is the second kind of expenditure which uh, incur which is incurred uh, whether market is um, ready to take your product or not whether that product will be successful in market or not that is the second question which we need to ask and that is responded by uh, certain questionnaires which are filled by the customers and surveys happens um, uh, within the market across the market therefore the second kind of preliminary expenses is conducting market survey third is legal drafting charges whatever documents <clears throat> are required to incorporate a particular company whatever agreements are required to be drafted at an initial stage so like agreement between you and the supplier the prospective supplier uh the company and the prospective uh, uh you know customer the company and the shareholders then uh, the company and the stakeholders like the banks which are giving loans to the company so all these legal um things are required to be drafted moa and aoa are also required to be drafted those moas and aoas are also um relevant part so all these drafting happens before the business commences so this again forms part of preliminary expenses for agreements relating to setup of business or for moa aoa etc the legal drafting happens so this is one of the preliminary expenditure the next one is the company's registration fees so whatever is the company's registration fees which is paid to roc registrar of companies again that particular fees is a preliminary expense because business has not started as yet <coughs> and this fees is paid before the business commences because the company is incorporated and for incorporation we need uh to pay the registration fees then expenses for public issue of shares or debentures whatever public issue um uh, is there whatever um uh, shares and debentures are listed in market whatever shares and debentures are um uh, you know raised so whether they are listed in market or not whether they are listed or unlisted okay there is a proper procedure which is required to be followed by the companies to raise capital so that particular procedure will entail certain expenses like underwriting commission uw commission means underwriting commission brokerage which is paid to the brokers then drafting printing of prospectus there is a concept called shelf prospectus also so all those things which are required to be done um now before the com company is incorporated all those things will form part of these expenses which is preliminary expenses now guys the um a more point of consideration over here is that these expenses are quite large these are not small expenses the professionals who draft these agreements take a lot of money the professionals who provide you um uh, raising of funds the services they uh, take a lot of money so these preliminary expenses are not small expenses they are actually huge expenses therefore the question is whether should they be um uh, allowed as a deduction in year 1 itself when you commence the business or should it be spread over a period of time that is the question which we need to answer in this particular section but before we come on to that let's understand the meaning of the word amortization what do you mean by amortization 
<coughs> okay. So amortization means to write off or to set off. That is the meaning of the word amortization. To write off or to set off. And how do you write off this particular expenditure called the preliminary expenditure? How do you write it off? Five equal installments after commencement subject to the following limit. So we will not write off this preliminary expenses in year one of commencement. We will write off this preliminary expenses in five years of commencement. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Let's take an example. <laughs> okay. So your business starts on 1st of January 2023. Your business starts from this particular date. Before this period, there are certain preliminary expenses which have been incurred. Say they are to the tune of 5 lakh rupees. Your business commences from 1st January 2023. Please tell me for how many years, till, till how many years, till what last date should I amortize this preliminary expenses? Till what date should I amortize the preliminary expenses? Please write in the comment box. Till how many years should I amortize these expenses? What is the last date till when I should amortize the expenses? Yes, Jyotish, it is applicable to corporate assess you only. <clears throat> till how many years? Till which year should the amortize take place? Amortization takes place. Okay. So, it will take place till 31st December. 31st December. Thirty first December Most of you are most of you are confusing yourself. Most of you are confusing yourself. Jyotesh <clears throat> rethink. Jyotesh rethink. Most of you are getting confused. Yes, Pankaj has amended his answer. Pankaj had given the wrong answer earlier. Pankaj has now amended his answer. Now is the correct answer. Jyotish Raj, correct. Correct. Now you have corrected the answer. So it is 2027. So from 2023 till 2027, 31st December 2027, you will write off this entire amount, right? 1 lakh rupees for each year. 1 lakh rupees for each year. For 5 years, you will write off this amount. 1 lakh rupees per year, you will write off this amount till 31st December 2027. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Okay. Then, uh, 5 equal installments. After commencement, subject to the following limits. What are the limits? There are certain limits uh, for pre incurring preliminary expenses. You cannot incur unlimited preliminary expenses. <coughs> the limits are <coughs> the limits are for non-corporate resident. A resident which is a non-corporate entity. A resident which is a non-corporate ent ent uh, entity. For them, the limit is 5% of the cost of project. For non-corporate resident, for a person who is not a corporate, which is not a company, which is apart from company, 5% of the cost of project. For an Indian company, 5% of cost of project or capital employed, whichever is higher. These are the two limits subject to which your um, uh, uh, the, the preliminary expenses should be incurred. Okay, If you incur preliminary expenses above these limits, then it, they will not be allowed. They will not be allowed as a reduction. So for non-corporate resident, the limit is 5% of the cost of project. For an Indian company, the limit is 5% of cost of project or capital employed, whichever is higher. This is the limit which you need to take into consideration. Now, sir, what do you mean by cost of project and capital employed? Guys, the definition of cost of project and capital employed is, <clears throat> what is cost of project? Cost of project is actual cost of fixed assets on the last day of the year of commencement. When the business has commenced, when the business has started, last day of the commencement, um, uh, last day of the year of commencement, whatever is the actual cost of fixed assets, that is the cost of the project. And what is capital employed? Capital employed is share capital debenture, long term borrowing, long term borrowing on the last day of the commencement year. So whichever year the business has commenced, last date of the commencement year, last date of the commencement year, the business will 
start um, uh, 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 you know uh, will calculate the capital employed as well as the cost of project both will be calculated at the last day of the commencement year so this is how the preliminary expenses will be computed yes this section is not applicable on foreign companies on foreign companies this section is not applicable it is only applicable to resident who is either an indian company or a uh, non corporate ssc yes guys so these are the limits subject to which section 35d will be allowed as a deduction okay sir got it now we move on to our next discussion discussion on our expenditure of interest on borrowings interest on borrowings now guys every businessman requires capital every businessman borrows some loan to uh, enable smooth running of his business loans are taken and interest is paid to banks uh, so that uh, the business can meet its long term and short term um, funds requirement that is the uh, objective of loan so what will happen to interest on loan whatever interest is paid on borrowed capital it will be allowed as a reduction under section 3613 that is the section under which interest on borrowed capital is allowed to be um, uh, allowed so interest on borrowed capital used for carrying on business or profession interest on borrowed capital used for purchasing capital asset now i've divided interest on loan um uh, the borrowing for two purposes two purposes are uh, purpose of uh, carrying on business or profession which means that you have taken loan for purchasing inventory for uh, repaying your creditors short term loan is there or you know sometimes we take bank overdraft we take cc limits cash credit all those are um, the interest borrowed on capital used for carrying on business and profession so if you are uh, doing revenue expenses from your um or working capital expenses from your uh, bor borrowings and loans then they will be allowed as a deduction in its entirety in the year of incurrence itself okay but if you are using the loan for building your assets you are developing plant and machinery using that particular loan okay you are developing uh, uh, you know uh, some fixed assets which are useful to you for a longer period of time using that borrowed capital then the interest is treated as to be treated as capital expense it will be added to the cost of the machinery it will be added to the cost of the asset so how will we add it to cost of asset let's see <clears throat> so the rule is the rule is interest for period up to commencement of business or put to use of asset so interest up to the commencement of business interest which you have paid for uh, the loan which you have borrowed for uh, building your capital building your plant and machinery building your buildings okay interest uh, which is paid for those borrowings which are um, uh, incurred for building your business but up to commencement of business or put to use of the asset so assets have not been put to use so business has not commenced assets are, asset has not been put to use before the assets were put to use or before the business has commenced you have incurred interest expenditure what will happen to that interest added to actual cost of the asset whatever asset is being made using that loan for which interest is paid you please add the interest to the actual cost of that particular asset you will add the interest you will add the interest to the add the interest cost to the actual cost of asset and claim depreciation over it so that interest also becomes capital uh, in nature that interest expense will become capital in nature but if the interest is paid for a period from put to use if you know put to use onwards you have paid uh, the interest which means you have paid the interest when your business has started operations and your uh, machinery is also put to use still your loan is not repaid and you are paying interest on that particular loan then guys the interest will be allowed as a deduction the interest will be allowed as a deduction to you that is how the interest is bifurcated if paid before commencement of business or before the assets were put to use if it, in that situation interest is paid then it is added to actual cost of asset but if the interest is paid beyond the period of put to use of asset when put to use is not happened and put to after put to use the um, uh, you know the asset has um, uh, been incurred or uh, the, the after put to use the interest has been incurred then it is allowed as a deduction under pgbp normal normally uh, the way we allow any other deduction it is allowed as a dedu deduction under section uh 3613 as pgbp okay so these are the two norms which are uh used to compute the deduction of interest <clears throat> then interest on discount on zero coupon bonds now this is a very very important um uh, discussion guys and a very easy one okay straight forward one the the discount which is given on zero coupon bonds now first of all please understand what do you mean by zero coupon bonds 
before that i would like you to know what is bonds <coughs> anyone please tell me what is bond what do you mean by bond please tell me what do you mean by bond in the chat box what kind of an instrument is a bond please write in the chat box what kind of instrument is a bond please write in the chat box what is a bond very good ravi very good very good vanshi <coughs> very good vanshi <clears throat> anyone else what do you mean by a bond what do you mean by a bond debenture is the right answer loan is the right answer so yes guys you are right bond means you are taking some loan from someone it is an instrument of taking loan that is known as bond okay so <clears throat> suppose if you have taken a bond on 1st of january 2022 and that bond is repayable on 31st of december 2025 you have taken the bond on 1st of january 2022 the bond is repayable on 31st december 2025 the face value of bond is 100 rupees and you are eligible for interest during the tenure of the bond at the rate of say 8% so 8% you are going to get in first year 8% you are going to get in second year 8% you're going to get in third year 8% you're going to get in fourth year so on and so forth so on 22 23 24 25 there are four years you will get 8% interest during this four years either in a cumulative manner or per year on a an annual basis okay now these bonds are usually risk free there's no risk attached to these bonds and bonds means your money 100 rupees will be returned back to you they will be returned back to you at the end of the maturity period so rupees 100 you will get back on 31st december 2025 and you will get interest at the rate of 8% which is 8 rupees 8 rupees 8 rupees 8 rupees during the tenure during this entire tenure you will get 8 rupees per year as interest amount that is how bonds are structured but the special thing about the zero coupon bonds is that special thing about zero coupon bonds is that there is no interest element on it there is no interest element on it there is no interest on zero coupon bonds so the interest is zero 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 interest is zero on zero coupon bonds yes <clears throat> adarsh is very right vivek is also good nice so zero coupon bonds means there is no interest which is given to the investor in zero coupon bonds sir if interest is not given to the investor what is the benefit which in, uh, which the in investor is deriving sir he is getting 100 rupees at the end of the period which was his initial investment so what is the benefit which is accrues to this particular uh, to this particular investor please write in the comment box if you know what is the benefit in zero coupon bonds please write in the comment box what is the benefit which accrues to um, a person who's uh, who's taking the zero coupon bonds what is the benefit of a person who's investing into zero coupon bonds there is no interest per annum which is given maturity value is also same as face value 100 there's nothing extra which is received then what is the benefit in zero coupon bonds what is the benefit of investment in zero coupon bonds rather you shouldn't invest in such bonds you should keep your money with you safely or invest it in your Uh, fixed deposit that will at least give you a return of six percent or five percent or whatever it is. Um, uh, what is the benefit? Yes, Pankaj, interest is zero. So, would you like to um, invest in these bonds if the interest is zero? What is the benefit to the investor, Pankaj? I am asking, what is the benefit to the investor? What is the benefit to the person who is purchasing these bonds? I am not asking the benefit to the company. Perfect. Vanshi is saying no risk, but Vanshi, there is no return also, no. <coughs> What is the benefit? Nandini says no. Yogesh, right answer, very good. Yes, return guarantee. Arey Pankaj, there is no return. 
हाउ इज रिटर्न गैरंटीड देर इज नो रिटर्न यू आर अर्निंग जीरो इंटरेस्ट एंड वॉट एवर यू हैव इन्वेस्टेड यू आर गेटिंग दैट बैक वॉट इज द रिटर्न देर इज नो रिटर्न सो गाइज द बेनिफिट ऑफ जीरो कूपन बॉन्ड इज दैट इट इज इश्यूड एट अ डिस्काउंट so if the face value of a zero coupon bond is 100 then it will not be given to you at 100 rupees it will be issued to you at a discount so maybe it will issue it will be it will be issued at a discount of rupees 30 if it is issued at a discount of rupees 30 then you will have to pay 70 rupees for this for this particular bond for purchasing this share you have to for purchasing this bond you have to pay 70 rupees so an in initial investment of 70 rupees will reap you a benefit of 30 rupees and you will get 100 rupees back at the end of the maturity period this 30 rupees is nothing but the accumulated interest which is imbibed in the discount it is nothing but the accumulated interest which is imbibed in the discount so there is a return in zero coupon bond as well but it is a return in a different way what is that different way different way is that it is issued on a discount it is issued at a discount and par value it is redeemed at par value it is issued at a discount and it is redeemed at par value so the difference between the issue price and the redemption price is actually the benefit which accrues to the investor which is known as discount on issue of debentures or zero coupon bonds now this discount is to be amortized over the period of the bond because this discount is an expense for the company this discount is an expense for the company so just like company would have paid the interest <clears throat> just like the company would have paid the interest company is paying this discount this discount is the expense for the company and this discount is to be amortized over the period of the bond so whatever is the period of the bond over that period this particular um uh, amount should be written off i'll give you an example 1st january 2022 i'm issuing a bond of face value of 1000 At an issue price of face value is thousand, its issue price is seven hundred and fifty. The bond is uh, redeemable. The bond is redeemable in two thousand and twenty twenty six. Okay, this is the redemption date. This is the redemption date, and it is a zero coupon bond. Now my question is, what is the amount of amortization? Question number one: What is the amount of amortization <clears throat> per year, per annum? Amount of amortization per annum. Every year, how much amount should be amortized? Should be hit as expense for the company. What is the amount of amortization? why company issues zero coupon bonds vivek company issues zero coupon bonds so that it doesn't have to um, pay interest in an annual manner and um, you know these bonds will enable the company to uh, you know reduce the burden of paying interest every year they will pay uh, interest once and for all at the maturity time they'll pay a, a, a entire 100 rupees to the um, uh, investors and they will initially uh, uh, you know give those um, uh, instruments or bonds at a discounted value that is the procedural benefit which will be there per annum interest per annum discount which is allowed as a deduction that is what we need to compute okay sir please tell me the amount of amount of per annum deduction amount of per annum deduction amount of per annum deduction what is the amount which is allowed as a deduction per year very good very good very nice rohit choudhary has written his answer 10 20 times it's okay rohit choudhary i've seen your answer that's okay okay yes guys you are right the amount of amortization per year is 50 rupees how did you compute it how did you compute it we computed it by subtracting the issue price from the redemption price so 1000 minus 750 we subtracted the issue price from the redemption price 
so thousand minus seven fifty divided by the number of years of life of this bond. Life of the bond is twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, and twenty six. Five years is the life of this bond. So the the amortization per year is computed as rupees fifty per year for the company. For the company. Perfect, guys. Correct answer. So yes, this was a small concept of zero coupon bonds. It's an important deduction. Okay, sir. So now we come on to the bop of all deductions and a very very tricky deduction, which is bad debts. <clears throat> very very tricky deduction, which is bad debts. Not an easy one, but a tricky one. Okay, bad debts. One of the most important, one of the most uh, confusing deductions of uh, your PGBP. section <coughs> it's very easy let me tell you it's very easy you just need to understand the logic behind um uh, the deduction and it's very very easy okay so let's start the deduction of bad debts the deduction on bad debts section 36 17 is the relevant section where bad debts are um are discussed okay so bad debts section 36 17 first of all i would like to i would like you to know what do you mean by bad debt in the comment box please tell me what do you mean by bad debt what is the meaning of bad debt please tell me what is the meaning of bad debt what do you mean by bad debt <clears throat> in the comment box i want the answer what do you mean by bad debt gautam gupta says hi hi gautam in short i want to know what do you mean by bad debt in short not recoverable from debtors perfect jyotish has given the right answer and the first right answer amount which is not recovered from the debtors irrecoverable one she is right one she is also right nandini is also right gautam gupta <laughs> Gautam Gupta is also right. The amount due from debtors, which we will not get. Yes, guys, you are absolutely right. Bad debt means bad debt means the amount which we are not going to get back from our debtors. Debtors are there, and our debtors are not ready to give this amount back to us. This is known as bad debt. So bad debt means the amount which we are not going to get back from our debtors. It is irrecoverable from our debtors. So guys, there are two things. Okay, thing number one is that. we expect that this debtor will not repay to us okay we feel that so how can you feel that what are the factors which you have seen that you can feel that the feeling is because of the factor that the business of the other person is not going well we know that our debtor's business is not going well we know that our debtor's net worth has been eroded which means his liabilities are much more than his assets you know the, this fact for sure for our debtor we ha we have a feeling we have a feeling that that particular debtor is not going to pay us uh, the due amount this is a feeling he has not denied the payment as yet please note he has not denied the payment as yet he has not denied the payment but we feel that since this debtor is going towards bankruptcy since the de this debtor is um, uh, having a liabilities much 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 higher than the assets since all the factors are against this particular debtor we feel that this debtor is not going to pay, pay us our money back and that feeling can be converted into an expense which is known as provision for bad debt what do you mean by word provision provision means expectation provision means expectation okay estimate or expectation so whenever we feel whenever we feel that this debtor might go bankrupt this debtor might not be able to pay us our money back then we are going to recognize um, uh, this particular feeling of our in our books of accounts by way of a provision but it's not necessary that whether uh, you know our feeling is correct or incorrect it's not necessary that our feeling will always be correct it's not necessary a feeling might be incorrect also a feeling might be incorrect so how how will our feeling be incorrect our feeling might be incorrect that we feel that he is moving towards bankruptcy and insolvency and we feel that he will not be able to pay us money but he pays back money to us right so our feeling might be correct or incorrect 
in future but as of now as of today i have debited my pnl account in financial accounting based on this feeling i have booked a expenditure known as provision for bad debt this is not the real bad debt it is bad debt has not incurred it is just our feeling it is just our emotions which is driving this particular expenditure it is not an actual expenditure it is not an actual expenditure it is just our emotions which have triggered this expenditure it is not an actual expenditure but yes it is debited to our p and l account as an expenditure <clears throat> and the second limb of it is actual bad debt this is not driven by feelings this is not driven by what we think this is the actual bad debt which has been incurred this is the actual debtors which have gone bad these are the actual debtors which have gone which have uh, told us that we are not going to pay you the money these are actual bad debts these are actual bad debts these are expected bad debts estimated bad debts or expected bad debts these are actual bad debts which means that these are bad debts which are um, actually which have incurred which have been incurred which have denied us to pay money which have gone bankrupt and insolvent this is known as actual bad debt and this is an actual expenditure so as you are aware guys income tax act doesn't permit expenditures which are based on feelings emotions and which are not actual these are not actual expenditures so income tax act will not allow provision for bad debt there are certain exceptions to it which we are going to discuss uh, subsequently but the broad principle is provision for bad debt not allowed as a deduction actual bad debt allowed as a deduction provision for bad debt not allowed as a deduction actual bad debt allowed as a deduction that is the primary principle now we discuss provision for bad debt in a little more detail manner right now yes sir okay so the usual principle provision for bad debt is not allowed as a deduction this is the usual principle okay but one exception to is, is to it is banks provision for bad debt is allowed as a deduction in case of banks yes even if it's an estimate if even if it's just a feeling which bank has and banks don't have this feeling guys rbi tells bank certain norms which if um, are not fulfilled then you treat those debtors as bad debts uh, so there are specified norms which rbi has told banks and on base of those norms provisions are created it doesn't depend upon the feeling of the bank it depends upon the norms which are stated by rbi to create these provisions so in case of banks both provisions as well as bad debts are allowed as a deduction but in case of other assessees like companies like hgf like businessman like <clears throat> any other proprietorship or uh, partnership etc etc provision for bad debt is not allowed provision for bad debt is not allowed actual bad debt is allowed provision for bad debt is not allowed in case of any other type of um, uh, type of uh, businessman but yes in case of banks in case of banks actual bad debts are also allowed and provision for bad debts are also allowed but not to the extent of double deduction what do you mean by double deduction i'll give you an example bank has given loan bank has given loan to mr a mr a was considered in one of the years for provision for bad debt okay mr a was considered uh, uh, to be a person who bank things that or rbi guidelines say that he will become bankrupt and he will not be able to pay you the money okay so we allowed mr a's amount of loan which mr long has taken mr a has taken from the bank as a deduction we allowed it in one of the years in the subsequent years third or fourth year um, mr a actually gone bankrupt and he his money got bad debt then we are not going to allow this particular expenditure again okay why because we have already allowed expenditure with respect to the provision so please remember in case of banks double deduction will not be permitted if you have claimed provision for bad debt as a deduction then you will not claim the actual bad debt as a deduction for the same amount for the same person you need to take care of this fact double deduction is not permissible this might lead to a double deduction situation but we will make sure that we are not reducing the amount doubly so next is in case of banks indian bank including cooperative banks and we we'll talk we'll talk about separately about foreign banks public financial institution state financial corporation state industry industrial development uh, investment corporation nbfcs okay we'll talk about indian banks which are pure banks 
we'll talk about the other banks other than indian banks okay for indian banks the maximum permissible amount which is allowed for provision for bad debt is 8.5% of the gross total income gti so the maximum permissible amount of bad debt which is provision for bad debt which is allowed for a bank is 8.5% of gti before allowing chapter 6a deductions before allowing chapter 6a deductions and before provision for bad debt deduction so gti will be computed before allowing the section 6a chapter 6a deductions and before allowing the provision for bad debt deductions both these should be um, uh, should not be reduced the gti should be before this amount and 8.5% of the gti is allowed as a deduction for provision for bad debt if your deduction is higher than 8.5% it will not be allowed as a deduction for provision also then in case of other banks in case of other banks <clears throat> the limit is okay before we come on to other banks 8.5% of the gti plus 10% of aggregate advances made by the rural branch of these banks okay so um, uh, the rural branches of these banks the original branches will have a limit of 8.5% of gti then there is an additional deduction for the rural branches of these banks 10% of the aggregate average advance made by the rural branches is allowed as a deduction um uh, for interest deduction for provision for bad debt will be allowed uh, additionally for the rural branches of these banks so if the branches are located in extreme um, villages or areas where urbanization is very less there then guys we will um uh, you know um, allow 10% additional deduction for provision for bad debts then we come on to the other banks other banks means foreign banks in case of foreign banks public financial institution which are not banks these are strictly not banks these are uh, financial institutions um, so there's slight difference between nbfc non banking financial corporation um, the state industrial investment corporation these corporations and banks what is the slight difference slight difference is that they are not allowed to carry on um, uh, public dealing in deposits they cannot take deposits so nbfc cannot take deposits from people at large so they cannot deal with um, the regular banking functions they are given certain specific banking functions like loan giving okay like investment loan like financial loans or you know some specific areas of bank they can work for but they cannot have full fledged banking operations just like banks so these entities will have a restriction of 5% of gti to their um, uh, provision limit provision limit is 5% of gti and 5% of gti will be uh, before chapter 6a deduction and before provision for bad debt deduction both these should not be reduced while computing the gti that is the limit which is prescribed okay sir now the question is what will happen if the amount of bad debt is recovered subsequently guys it may so happen that as of now you have recognized some amount as a bad debt right but subsequently the bad debt gets recovered subsequently the bad debts get recovered so bad debt recovery section 41 4 bad debts get recovered subsequently at a subsequent point in time bad debts get recovered this can be a probable um, uh, option which is there that you know at a later point in time subsequently the bad debts get recovered the bad debt amount get recovered so this recovery will lead to an income for the businessman but now please understand one thing very very carefully okay the bad debt which was disallowed in the earlier years its recovery will not be taxable let me repeat the bad debt which was disallowed in the earlier year its recovery will not be taxed and the bad debt which was allowed in the earlier year its recovery will be taxed the the formula is very simple the bad debt which was disallowed in the earlier year for whatever reason however you know bad debts usually are allowed right actual bad debt when it is incurred that is allowed as a deduction but suppose i am assuming that in the earlier years you did not allow that bad debt as a deduction so now when recovery happens then also you cannot offer it to tax as income government of india will not um, uh, you know um, uh, tax it again but the bad debt which was allowed as a deduction in the earlier year that if that amount gets recovered then guys that will be treated as income that will be treated as income so bad debt recovery taxable as pgbp if recovery amount exceeds the disallowed amount so the amount to the extent of disallowance will not be 
added to income it will not be treated as income but the amount which is over and above the disallowed amount then that will be treated as income of the um uh, of the bad debts so bad debt recovery is treated as income if it is if it is not disallowed in the earlier year so the amount which is not disallowed in the earlier year that is allowed as a income okay sir okay let's take an example also please see this example it's a very nice example which has been carved out okay all right so bad debt claimed in the earlier year was 8 lakh rupees bad debt claimed in the earlier year was 8 lakh rupees entire 8 lakh rupees was allowed as a deduction okay bad debt claimed was 8 lakh rupees entire 8 lakh rupees was allowed as a deduction in the earlier year you have reduced your income by the amount of 8 lakh rupees in the earlier year entire amount is allowed as a deduction in the earlier year so any recovery is taxable any amount which is recovered from this 8 lakh rupees is taxable as pgbp any recovery is taxable as pgbp however if out of this 8 lakhs 6 lakh was allowed in the earlier year and 2 lakh was not allowed in the earlier year <clears throat> out of this 8 lakh 6 lakh was allowed in the earlier year 2 lakh was not allowed in the earlier year then guys its recovery will be taxed only to the extent of the amount which is allowed its recovery will be taxed to the extent of amount which is allowed so if entire 8 lakh rupees is allowed then only 6 lakh rupees will be taxed are you getting me or not so the amount which is recovered that will be taxed only till the extent of 6 lakh rupees <laughs> let's see what is the conclusion so suppose suppose if 1 lakh rupees is recovered suppose is if 1 lakh rupees is recovered then we will assume that this 1 lakh rupees is from this 2 lakh rupees this 1 lakh rupees is from this 2 lakh rupees which which was not allowed as a deduction in the earlier year it will not be taxable in hands of the assessee in the current year but if this uh, 1 lakh rupees is increased to 2 lakh rupees if 2 lakh 50000 rupees was recovered then guys out of this 2 lakh 50000 rupees 2 lakh rupees will not be taxed because it was not allowed in the earlier year and only 50000 rupees is to be taxed which is uh, allowed in the earlier year so amount which is allowed as a deduction in the earlier year will be taxed amount which is disallowed as an expenditure in the earlier year will not be taxed because disallowance means <coughs> you did not allow this expense as an uh, as a expense so if you are not allowed this particular expense as a deduction then its recovery should also also not be um, uh, taxed should not be treated as income so if it's entire 1 lakh rupees it's if 1 lakh rupees is recovered we will assume that this 1 lakh rupees is from uh, the 2 lakh rupees which has not been uh, allowed and we will not tax this 1 lakh rupees and if this Uh, uh, amount uh, is is two lakh fifty thousand rupees. Then we will assume that two lakh rupees is from two lakh rupees, and balance fifty thousand is from six lakh rupees. So only fifty thousand will be taxable as PGBP. Will be taxable as PGBP. All right. So welcome to this session of PGBP chapter. Quick revision. Uh, we have already completed the first three parts of the revision. This is the fourth part, guys. And if you have not seen the first three parts, then please. check out the youtube uh, my youtube channel and the playlist the all the parts are saved over there for the entire revision of pgbp chapter and yes today is the fourth and the final part which is there for all of us okay and in this particular part we are going to focus on disallowances okay in the earlier parts we had focused on deductions which are allowances and in this particular part we are going to focus on disallowances sir what are disallowances guys certain expenditure despite of the fact that they are incurred for business purpose they are used for running business they are used for carrying on the business despite of all those features which are present in those expenditure income tax act says i will not permit you to reduce your profit to the extent of that expenditure i am not going to allow you deduction of that particular expenditure those are known as disallowances sir but why income tax act does so why income tax act says that um i am not going to allow expenditure of this particular expense despite of the fact that this expenditure is very much allowable under the income tax act uh, it it fulfills the condition that these expenditures are wholly and solely incurred for business purposes 
these expenditure are utilized for running business so despite of all these features which these expenditure have why are they being disallowed guys they are being disallowed because uh, the assessee or the businessman does not do certain basic compliances one of the compliances which a businessman is required to do in his every expenditure is tds tax deducted at source if a businessman doesn't deduct tax deducted at source doesn't deduct tax at source uh, from his expenditure then income tax act will say we are not going to allow the expenditure of that particular um, uh, portion where tds has not been deducted sir what do you mean by tds so guys before coming on to today's first disallowance name of the disallowance is disallowance for tds default tds deduction either you have not done tds deposit you have not done before coming on to this particular disallowance which is section 40a disallowance i would like to discuss the concept of tds with all of you all right yes first we are going to discuss the concept of tds or in the western countries it is popularly known as the withholding tax in india it is known as tax deducted at source tds both means one and the same thing so guys first we need to understand what is this um, tds and then we are going to jump on to our conclusion um, uh, you know how would an expense be disallowed if tds is not complied by the businessman now you can see a photograph over here you can see a photograph over here please tell me in the chat box who is this gentleman who seen in the photograph if you are aware about him who is this gentleman please name it in the chat box please name it in the chat box who is this gentleman what is the name of this gentleman good morning vanshi good morning kirti padmavati shrinivasan good morning okay who is this gentleman who what is name of this gentleman i want both the names okay not only the last name wow megha tomar is very smart she is written ambani ji i want i don't want the last name i want the first name also yes he is the business tycoon of the country mukesh ambani he owns a big conglomerate by the name of reliance reliance has various um subsidiaries various businesses where reliance is into yes it is one of the biggest conglomerates of the indian country one of the biggest businessman of the indian country who is mr mukesh ambani now guys if we talk about Reliance Industries Limited. It has a lot of employees. You know, um, uh, as per my knowledge goes, Reliance Industries Limited has more than two lakh employees, and Reliance Industries Limited is paying salaries to the two lakh employees. Obviously, Reliance Industries Limited is paying salaries to the two lakh employees. Now, the question is that, sir, is this salary an allowable expenditure from an in income tax perspective? in the profit and loss account which is prepared for reliance industries limited is it an allowable expenditure answer is a big yes it is definitely an allowable expenditure so uh, salary expenditure will come in the debit side of the profit and loss account of reliance industries limited it will be allowed as an expenditure because it is absolutely a business expenditure which pertains to um, reliance industries limited so the profit and loss account which reliance industries limited will make it will have a debit balance it will have a de debit um hit of salaries which are paid to 2 lakh employees wow guys 2 lakh employees are earning salary from lines industries limited now the the catch is that lines industries limited is paying salaries to these 2 lakh employees now the salaries which are being paid to the 2 lakh employees of lines industries limited tell me something whether these salaries are taxable in hands of the respective employees or not whether this is taxable income in hands of the respective employees or not answer is a yes so the employees should offer this income to tax as salary and yes they should pay taxes on this salary to government of india reliance industries limited is paying salaries to the employees employees should pay taxes on these salaries to government of india of course yes the employees should pay it the 2 lakh employees of reliance industries limited should pay the a tax to government of india on their salaries for sure now guys income tax act what is the responsibility of income tax act responsibility of income tax act is to administer whether these 2 lakh people are paying their taxes truly duly or not income tax act to make sure that these 2 lakh people are paying taxes um, uh, to the government of india uh, on their salaries perfectly aptly or not now guys 
the point is it is really difficult to track 2 lakh people's salary their taxes which is paid to government of india it is very very difficult to track government of india is uh, you know in a difficult situation it has to track 2 lakh people together who are paying salary who are being paid salary to track these 2 lakh people is a very very difficult task for government of india you know to make sure that they have paid taxes to make sure that they have duly filed their return of income to make sure that they have duly um, uh, uh, you know paid whatever taxes are due calculated properly proper calculation should be there this is a difficult task for government of india because 2 lakh people is a huge amount and guys reliance industries limited is not the only company in the country there are several several such companies who are employing several several thousands and lakhs of people in their uh, payroll imagine how difficult is it for government of india to track each and every employee's uh, taxes how difficult is it it is very difficult it's lump sum it's very very voluminous since it's very very voluminous what do income tax act do income tax act would transfer its responsibility to mr mukesh ammani income tax act will ask mr mukesh ammani dear mr mukesh ammani you please become my agent you know i am using some raw words okay these are not law of language i am using some raw words in front of you just to make you understand income tax act is it's saying dear mr mukesh ammani please you become our agent you deduct taxes from the salaries you pay to your employees and pay to government of india i'll give you an example i'll give you an example suppose one of the employees of reliance industries limited is having a salary of 7 lakh rupees if we calculate the taxes which are due to this particular employee suppose the taxes which are calculated is 13000 rupees suppose i have not calculated i have not seen the calculation i am just taking a rough figure okay so suppose uh, the uh, the income tax which is to be paid by this particular employee okay let's increase the amount a little bit for uh, rounding of consideration is 30000 rupees okay 30000 rupees is the tax which this employee has to pay to government of india right now what is the government of india requesting mr mukesh ammani government of india is requesting mr mukesh ammani dear mr mukesh ammani you please pay only 6 lakh 70 thousand to your employee mukesh ammani is saying then where should i pay the balance 30 thousand government of india is saying pay this 30 thousand to government of india treasury to government of india account mukesh ammani is asking why should i do so government of india is saying you should do so because i don't want to run after each and every employee you become my agent you deduct tax from the salary of the employee and pay it to me i will be relieved of the burden of running after each and every employee and making sure that they have paid their taxes on salary in an appropriate way mukesh ammani is absolutely furious Mukesh Amani is absolutely, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, angry on income tax department. Mukesh Amani is saying income tax department, look, income tax department. I have lots of work to do. I have such big companies whom I need to administer. I have big, big um, uh, work to do. My taxes, I have to pay my taxes also. I have to administer my taxes also. I don't have time to do all this charity work for you. I am not going to become your agent. You please collect your taxes yourself. I am not going to do that. Mr. Mukesh Amani is uh, a little. a uh, disheartened mr mukesh mani is little angry because he has to do his work leaving his work income tax act wants to do uh, wants to make him do his their work not fair at all mukesh mani saying i am not uh, ready to do all this stuff for you i am going to pay entire 7 lakh rupees to my employee income tax act you approach the employee and you recover 30000 from that particular employee i am not going to do all this um, uh, nonsense because i'm i'm not interested in doing work for you i am doing work for myself i will help my business why should i help you why should i help you now income tax department is the law of land income tax department is not going to um, you know leave this matter so easily income tax act department tells mr mukesh amani okay mr mr mukesh amani if you are being arrogant if you are being adamant if you are being uh, non cooperative with income tax department you will have to face the brunt what is the brunt what is the punishment which mukesh amani has to pay uh, income tax act is saying the expenditure which you think that is allowable the expenditure which you think is allowable 
I'm going to disallow it if you do not deduct TDS and deposit it to government of India. If you do not deduct TDS and deposit to government of India. So the entire amount of salaries will be disallowed if you don't deduct tax and pay it to government of India. This is the punishment that you have to follow if you do not follow the instructions of the income tax department. So in a way, Mukesh money is being forced. Mukesh money is being forced to ensure that compliance of its employees is also made along with its own compliances. This is the concept of TDS. Yes, I have used some raw words like agent. Okay, there's no such word in law. There's no agent principal relationship between Mukesh Ambani and Income Tax Department. Please don't um, uh, take me wrong. These are just examples. These are just a way of telling you uh, so that you're able to understand properly. But the crux of the matter is every expenditure which is there in the PNL account, almost every expenditure is subject to TDS. Yes, on behalf of some other person, Mukesh Ambani has to deduct TDS and deposit it to Government of India. What is the benefit of Government of India? A. Government of India's administration is reduced. B, everyone comes under the tax net. Everyone is um, uh, paying taxes. This is ensured because, you know, all these 2 lakh employees, some employees might not be paying taxes. Some employees might be evading taxes. Now, by introducing provision of TDS, the employees cannot escape their tax liability because Mukesh money will make sure that tax is deducted and paid to government treasury. So government has the information of all the 2 lakh employees of Mukesh money. Government has the information. When government has the information, TDS ensures that tax evasion is curtailed. There is no one who is not paying taxes to government of India. This is made sure by these provisions of TDS. So yes, crux of the matter is, if on any expenditure, TDS is not deducted or after deduction, it is not deposited to government treasury, the expenditure will be disallowed in hands of the businessman. This is the first disallowance which we are going to do today. All right, it is default in TDS deduction or deposit. Whenever a businessman defaults in deducting TDS from the expenditure or depositing it to government treasury, then there is a disallowance which is uh, which uh, which arises for this particular businessman. This disallowance is um, a punishment. In a way, it's a punishment for not deducting TDS for not deducting taxes at source um, uh, with respect to the expenditure. So default in TDS deduction or TDS deposit section 40 subsection A, A small a, okay, small a. All right. Now this section is divided into two parts. First one is for non-resident. So if Mukesh money is paying some expense to a non-resident, like it has a non-resident employee or it has a non-resident person who's providing some services. If Mukesh money is making a payment to a non-resident, but not deducting taxes from that particular payment, or if Mukesh money is making payment to residents and not deducting tax from those payments. So section is divided into two parts. Now guys, in case of non-residents, taxes have to be reduced from the payments which are made to non-residents. Okay, Taxes have to be reduced for sure. When the taxes have to be reduced, and if you do not reduce taxes from the payments which are made to non-resident, 100% of the expenditure is disallowed. Yes, 100% of the expenditure will be disallowed. We will not allow even a single rupee of that particular expenditure. I'll give you an example. Suppose Reliance Industries Limited hires a very um, uh, sophisticated engineer from Germany. Okay, That engineer provides services in India. The payment is made in foreign currency to uh, that German uh, resident. He's a non-resident in India. He provides some services, comes to India and fly back to his own country, back to his own country. So after he flies back to his own country, Reliance Industries Limited make a payment of 1 lakh rupees to that particular person. Now, before making that 1 lakh rupees, deduction of the appropriate TDS should be made. Suppose the deduction rate is 10%. Reduction should be made at the rate of 10,000 rupees and only 90,000 is to be paid to that particular German person. So what should happen of that 10,000? That 10,000 is to be deposited to government of India. 10,000 is to be deposited to government of India. Only then rupees 1 lakh deduction will be eligible to be allowed in the PNL account of Mr. Mukesh Amani. If the expenditure is not subject to TDS, then disallowance of that expenditure will happen to the extent of entire 100%. Entire 100% rupees are uh, disallowed to that particular non-resident. Now, this provision with respect to residents will lead to disallowance of 30% only. Okay. So, in case the payment is made to resident, okay. I was taking example of Germany, right? Now, I take example of India. So, you know, Mukesh Shamani is paying some uh, visiting fees for an Indian engineer. 
not a german engineer but an indian engineer his expense is debited on the pnl account okay tds is required to be deducted from this particular expense before making payment to that particular uh, resident but if tds is not deducted or not paid then 30% of the amount is uh, disallowed sir why is it so that in case of non resident the disallowance is um uh, uh, 100% and in case of resident the disallowance is 30% why is it so there's a mismatch there's a mismatch over here the disallowance is only 30% in case of resident it is 100% in case of non resident sir why this disallowance is there we are unable to understand why is disallowance is there so guys this disallowance is there because in case of non residents it's difficult to recover taxes from the non resident because non resident might go back to their respective countries so it's difficult to recover taxes from them suppose it is a case of resident we can go to their home their home is in india only they are residing in india only we can go to their home and collect taxes from them directly if reliance industries limited do not deduct taxes we will go to their home we will um, uh, deduct uh, collect taxes from the engineer itself so in case of resident payments the disallowance is only to the extent of 30% in case of non resident payment the disallowance is to the extent of 100% a uh, stricter regime for non residents a uh, uh, a lenient regime for residents because residents government of india is very sure if reliance is not going to deduct tax then they are going to um, uh, income tax department will go to their home and directly collect the taxes therefore the regime is uh, uh, easier for residents and yes jyotish has reminded me correctly you know uh, the way a uh, shortcut way to remember which is the subsection this is 40 ai this is 40 aia a way to remember which one is 40 ai and what is which one is 40 ai is 40 ai we are dedicating to non residents and in india it is said that atithi devo bhava which means we respect our um, uh, our our uh, mehman who are coming to our home uh, so these are mehman for india non residents are atithi for india so we are going to respect them we are giving going to give the first section to the non resident and the second section to the resident second section is section ia this is a shortcut way of of um, uh, you know remembering the subsections all right now disallowance is made for both of these expenditures okay now uh, you know sometimes uh, non deduction of taxes is not deliberate it is owing to some mistake mistakenly in uh, the the businessman is not able to um, uh, actually deduct taxes sometimes this mistake happens okay so this disallowance is a temporary disallowance what do you mean by temporary disallowance temporary disallowance means this disallowance is going to reverse in the next years if the compliance is made in the next year so what do you mean by that i'll just explain temporary disallowance okay so the disallowance of tds which is made in the current year is a temporary disallowance which means i'll give you an example okay i'll give you an example in the year 2021 22 reliance industries limited paid 2 lakh rupees to mr x this was subject to tds of 10000 rupees but reliance industries limited did not deduct tds on this particular amount while making payment to mr x so obviously guys the amount will be disallowed amount will be disallowed in financial year 2021 22 but guys in 2022 23 immediately next year reliance industries limited had to again pay 1 lakh rupees to mr x it had to again pay 1 lakh rupees to mr x but now this time Uh, the tds which is required to be deducted is 5000 rupees from mr x account now uh, reliance industries limited uh, is reminded of the fact that it did not deduct the tds in last year as well so in the current year it deducted tds not only of the current year but also of the previous year so the total tds deducted by reliance industries limited in 2022 to 23 is 1 lakh minus 10000 minus 5000 which is 85000 is remitted to mr x Eighty-five thousand rupees is remitted to Mr. X after deducting TDS of the current year as well as of the previous year. So the disallowance which was made in the previous year of this particular amount that will be allowed as a deduction in the current year's PNL account. This is known as temporary disallowance. Temporary disallowance means a disallowance which is uh, made in one of the years, but in the subsequent years it is reversed. 
Why? Because you have deducted the TDS and deposited it to government treasury. That is the catch. This is known as a temporary disallowance. This temporary disallowance um, uh, is, is uh, allowed in the next year if the TDS is deducted and deposited to government treasury in the next year. That is the concept. Okay, sir. Got it. So let's now move on to the allowance in subsequent period. Okay. So when the allowance should be made, guys, allowance should be made in the subsequent period. Whenever you deduct TDS in the subsequent period, when you, whenever you deposit uh, TDS in the subsequent period, then you get allowance for the expenditure which has incurred in, <coughs> which has been incurred in previous year. Allowance can be uh, taken in the current year. So in the current year, two allowances can be taken. One of the expense of the current year, second of the expense of the previous year. Both the expenses can be allowed as a deduction in the current year if you make TDS payments in the current year. That is the uh, concept. Okay, sir. Got it. Now, guys, there are two things. First one is the deduction. Second one is the deposit. Now, please understand the difference between deduction and deposit. Okay. I'll explain this difference by way of an accounting entry. By way of an accounting entry, I will explain this difference to you. Okay, sir. All right. So, in the year 2021-22, you put an entry in your books of account, salary account debit, to bank account, to TDS. This is the accounting entry that you are going to put for your salary expenditure. This is the accounting entry which you are going to put for your salary expenditure. Suppose your salary is 20,000 rupees. Okay. Employee is going to get. Employee is going to get 18,000 rupees. And the TDS which is deducted from this salary is 2,000 rupees. Employee is going to get 18,000 rupees. This is going to be created in employee's bank account. Okay. So employee is going to get 18,000 rupees. And you are going to uh, credit TDS payable account as 2000 rupees. This is the accounting entry which you're going to put. And guys, on the due date of uh, the date when TDS is to be paid to government of India, you will pay TDS, you will pass another entry, TDS account debit to bank. TDS account debit to bank. This 2000 rupees you're going to pay to government of India. This 2000 rupees you're going to pay to government of India. This is the second entry which you're going to make. So first entry which you're going to make is salary account debit 20,000 rupees to bank. Okay, you're going to pay the salary to employee, but not full 20,000, only 18,000. Okay, to TDS, 2000 rupees you're going to deduct TDS from salary and pay it to government of India. Next is TDS account debit to bank. You're going to pay the TDS account also debit uh, also to bank of um, uh, the, your, your uh, government registry. Okay. So guys, this entry is the deduction entry. This entry is the deduction entry. And this entry is the deposit entry. This entry is the deposit entry. When you deposit this TDS to government of India, this is the deposit entry. This is the deduction entry. Now, in case of deduction entry, if you do not deduct TDS and you pay the entire amount 20,000 to uh, employees bank account, then it is known as default in deduction. And if you pass this entry, but you fail to deposit TDS to government uh, treasury. If you fail to deposit uh, the TDS to government of India, then it is known as default in deposit. So two defaults are there. First, default in deduction of tax. Second, de uh, de default in deposit of tax. So two defaults are there which are uh, dealt with over here. Now, guys, obviously, you can rectify both of these defaults. If deduction is not made, in the subsequent year, you can make the deduction and claim the um, uh, claim the entire expense uh, in the next year. If you have made the deduction, but you have not made the deposit of TDS, then whenever you make the deposit of TDS, in that year, you are going to claim the reduction of the expenditure. Okay, sir. Got it. Okay. So let's come back to our provision. Let's come back to our section. Section deals with two, uh, two kind of uh, miscompliances. 
miscompliance number one deduction or deposit okay now miscompliance number one is that you have not made the deduction you have al also not made the deposit and you have made both the things in the subsequent year you have not deducted the tds you have not deposited the tds and you have done both of these things in the subsequent year you did not do it in the current year the year in which expenditure was incurred you did not deduct tds in that particular year so guys in the year when the um, uh, deposit of tds is made in the subsequent year when tds deposit is made in that particular year the expense will be allowed to this particular assessee so expense will be allowed in the year of deposit of tds whenever deposit is made um, of that particular tds then the expense will be allowed as a deduction so deduction is not made deposit also not made in the current year when the expense was incurred it was made in the subsequent period so in the year when deposit of tds is made then the expense will be allowed now there's another miscompliance that deduction you made in the current year but deposit you made in the subsequent year okay now the condition is <coughs> you have complied with first section <coughs> Dep deduction you have done the first entry which we wrote over here <coughs> <coughs> The first entry which we wrote over here, you had made the first entry in the year itself, in the current year itself, but you did not deposit. Deposit entry you did not made. You did not deposit the TDS to government treasury. Then deduction is made. Deduction in the current year, but deposit in the subsequent year. Deposit you made in the subsequent year. Then what will happen? And let us also take an example. Okay. Let us take an example also, guys. Okay. So, in the year 2021-22, you had to deduct tax on 1 lakh rupees. You had deducted tax on 1 lakh rupees. But, till 31st of March 2022, no TDS was deposited to government treasury. TDS was not deposited to government treasury expense was 1 lakh rupees tds was deducted from the books of accounts now guys for this particular year suppose the return filing date is 31st october 2022 suppose the return filing date is 31st october 2022 so you have to deposit this particular amount till 31st october 2022 suppose if you have deposited the tds till 31st october 2022 which financial year is 31st october 2022 this is the next financial year Okay, it is 22 to 23. Deduction is made. Deduction is made in 21-22. Deposit is not made in 21-22. Deposit is made, is made beyond 31st March 22, which means the deposit is made in the financial year 22-23. Guys, in this particular year, financial year 22-23, when the deposit is made to government treasury, um, uh, which year will the expense be allowed? Now, let me explain it to you. If the deposit is made before the filing of return of income if the deposit is made before the filing of return of income which is before 31st october so if the deposit is made by 31st october then the allowance of expenditure will be made in 21 22 and if the deposit is made say on 1st of november 2022 then the deduction of expense will be allowed in 22 23 so guys, return filing date, till return filing date, AO is able to ascertain whether you have deposited the TDS or not. So he will see whether you have deposited the TDS or not. If you have deposited the, deposited the TDS till the return filing date, then guys, till this particular date, uh, the deduction will be allowed in the year when the expense, the TDS was deducted. The expense will be allowed in that year itself. But if the TDS is not deducted in this particular year, and uh, oh sorry tds is deducted in this year but it is deposited in the next year beyond the return filing date then the expense will be allowed in the subsequent year which is 22 23 that is the provision which is there in law let's read the section now let's read the section guys so you have made the reduction in the current year but you have not made the deposit in the current year you have made the deposit in the subsequent year what will happen two cases guys two cases deposit of tds till the due date of filing of return of income of current year if you have deposited the tds till the due date of filing of roi in the current year then expense to be allowed in the current year itself 
in our case current year was 2122 and if the deposit after due date of filing of return if the deposit is made after the due date of filing of return then expense is allowed in the year of deposit of tds whenever you deposit the tds then in that particular year the expense will be allowed if the deposit is made after due date of filing of return of income that is the law so you have to <clears throat> see what is the return filing date of that particular current year if the return filing date till the return filing date if you um, you know deposit the tds then it's okay then the deduction will be allowed in the year of expense itself but if you um, uh, deposit the tds after the return filing date then guys the tds the expense will be allowed in the year when the tds is deposited to government treasury that is the law so yes a little a little um, uh, you know a different kind of provision which is there in this particular case but yes an important one which is very very important from an exam standpoint okay sir got it so guys now we move on to our next sections of our syllabus two very very important section maintenance of books of accounts and audit of books of accounts these are two sections which are very very important from an exam standpoint and maintenance of books of accounts is section 44 aa <clears throat> read with rule 66 six. <coughs> okay maintenance of books of accounts guys what do you mean by books of accounts as i have already told you income tax act would want to see your profit and loss account would want to see your balance sheet to ascertain whether you have claimed right expenditure or not in your books of accounts income tax act would want to see your profit and loss account would want to see your balance sheet would want to see your um, uh, you know business um, uh, details would want to see your uh, things which are you are doing in your business and they would want to see your books of accounts so books of accounts are required to be maintained by um, a certain category of people as per the income tax okay they are separate books of accounts uh, financial books of accounts are separate income tax books of accounts are separate there are two different books of accounts which are there so maintenance of books of accounts section 44a read with rule 6f now this is divided into two parts first is for specified business other one is for other business or profession okay so for specified persons the limits for requirement of maintenance of books of accounts is given in this particular chart let's read the limits <clears throat> okay sir now for specified persons if you have an existing setup existing setup means you are already a businessman and you are doing your business for a very long time business or profession as the case may be from a very long time so you have an existing setup then what are we going to see we are going to see gross receipts of all the past 3 years your gross gross receipts of all the past 3 years should be more than 1 lakh rupees per year if your gross receipts of all the past 3 years is more than rupees 1.5 lakh per year then you are required to prepare your books of accounts as per rule 6f you are required to prepare your books of accounts as per rule 6f if your gross receipts for all past 3 years exceeds rupees 1.5 lakh per year and if your gross receipts of any of the past year is less than 1.5 lakh rupees then you are required to prepare your books of accounts normally to compute the taxable income that's it then um, you know rule 6f rule 6f is the stringent provision where uh, more amount of books of accounts more uh, specified books of accounts are required to be prepared by an assessee so if you are not having your uh, gross receipts uh, for more than 1.5 lakhs in any of the three previous years in any one of the three previous years then you are going to prepare your books of accounts normally okay not as per rule 6f rule 6f is the critical rule is a more complicated rule as compared to the normal books of accounts so these are the two limits which you are required to fulfill now if you are a new setup and you do not have past years books of accounts then what will we see we will see your its we will see your expected gross receipts if your expected gross receipts are likely to exceed 1.5 lakhs per year then you are required to prepare your books of accounts as per rule 6f if your expected gross receipts are less than 1.5 lakh per year then your books of accounts are required to be maintained um uh, you know as per normal standards okay normally to uh, uh, to be prepared to compute the taxable income normal books of accounts are required to be prepared but if you fall in a 6f category then guys certain additional books are required to be prepared if you are fall under rule 6f category okay sir got it okay now we come on to other business and profession 
so if you are not specified business and profession and you are other business and profession then the receipt which are applicable to you is gross receipts of any past 3 years if any of the past 3 years gross receipts exceeds 25 lakh per year in case of huf rupees 25 lakh per year now we are dealing with gross receipts of any of the past three years if gross receipts of any of the past years exceeds rupees 10 lakh per year in case of huf rupees 25 lakhs or income of any past three years is more than 1.2 lakhs per year then guys you are required to prepare your books of accounts in a normal way books of accounts are required to be prepared in a normal way if you are um, uh, falling under, under this particular category now let me just remove these circles which are visible on the board now you can see the uh, uh, see the limits clearly so the rule is for other businesses for other businesses yes absolutely pankaj so so there's a big difference between this limit and this limit. Pankaj, you are absolutely right. Difference is that over here, we need to see gross receipts of any past three years. Okay. If even in any one of the year, the gross receipt is over 10 lakh rupees, then you are required to prepare your books of accounts. If any one year exceeds 10 lakh rupees. However, in the earlier case, in this particular case, only when all the past year's gross receipts was more than 1.5 lakhs, then rule 6F applies. So there's a big difference between this part and this part. This says any of the past three years, and this says all of the past three years. Over here, the strict condition is for any of the past three years. If even one year in the past three years is exceeding 10 lakh rupees, then you're required to prepare your books of accounts. Okay, sir. Then in this case, if you're a new setup, if you are a new setup, if you are a new setup, then expected gross receipts should exceed um, uh, 10 lakh rupees or expected income should exceed 1.2 lakh rupees for any one of the past three years. Any one of the past three years, then you are required to prepare your books of accounts. Now, if gross receipts of all the three years is less than 10 lakh rupees, if gross receipts of all the three years is less than 10 lakh rupees and income of all the past years is less than 1.2 lakh per year. And expected income is also less than 1.2 lakh per year then no books of accounts are required to be maintained no books of accounts are required to be maintained in this particular case the last case again the thing to be noted is gross receipts of all past three years should ex should be less than 10 lakh rupees if gross receipts of even if one year is more than 10 lakh rupees then also guys we will be required to prepare our books of accounts so if you don't want to prepare books of accounts all past years all past three years gross receipts should be above should be less than 10 lakh rupees that is the principle which we are going to follow in this particular case okay sir got it so guys this is the provision for books of accounts this is the provision which is related to books of accounts which are required to be prepared as per the income tax act books of accounts which are required to be prepared as per the income tax act and now we come on to tax audit. What are the limits which are specified in tax audit? Okay, in case of tax audit, now guys, <clears throat> Income Tax Act uh, definitely pays regard to the statutory audit which happens as per the Companies Act. So you must have read the statutory audit which is done by Chartered Accountant as per the Companies Act. That audit is very much there. Uh, there is no embargo that that audit will be conducted. That audit will definitely be conducted by the um, uh, Companies Act uh, as per the Companies Act regulation. But if Income Tax Act thinks so, if it thinks fit, then it will order special tax audits from a CA, again, this power is also given to a chartered accountant. Okay. Then it can give tax audit to a chartered accountant and chartered accountant will perform tax audit to your books of accounts. The perspective in tax audit will entirely be tax. Tax audit will be focused on tax. The allowances, disallowances, everything which is related to tax, tax audit will focus on that particular thing. Uh, it will not focus on any other compliances, any other ROC compliances or, you know, internal audit, internal controls, compliances. Tax auditor is not bothered about all those things. Tax audit auditor is only and only bothered about your tax compliances. So who all are required to get their tax audit done? The conditions are, conditions are, let us see the first condition your turnover limit is 10 crores 
your turnover limit is 10 crores which means you are required to uh, uh, get your tax audit done only when your income uh, your turnover exceeds 10 crores if your cash receipts and cash payments are less than equal to 5% of total receipts and total payments respectively if your entire business is based on pure and pure banking transactions if your entire business is based on pure and pure banking transaction and you do your cash transaction only up to the extent of say 5% of the total receipts or 5% of the total payments, that's it, even less than 5%, okay, 4%, 3%, then your turnover limit for getting your tax audit done is 10 crore rupees. Your tax audit will be required to be done above 10 crore rupees. Now, if, if you, you don't have cash receipts and cash payments, which are um, uh, you know, uh, 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 your cash receipts and cash payments are more than 5% of your total receipts and total payments, then the turnover limit will be 2 crores and 1 crore respectively. 2 crores in case where section 44 AD applies, wherever section 44 AD, um, now the presumptive taxation reg regime you are applying, there your turnover limit will be 2 crores and in any other case, in any other business, the turnover limit will be 1 crore. These are the tax audit limits which you are required to fulfill. These are the tax audit limits which are um, there in your case. So the general limit is 1 crore. Okay. If your turnover is above 1 crore, then you are required to prepare your tax audit, get your tax audit done. So the general um, uh, limit is uh, uh, 1 crore. Two exceptions to it. If you are covered under 44 AD section, then your turnover limit increases to 2 crores. And if your cash receipts and cash payments is less than 5% of the total receipts and total payments, then your turnover limit is even higher 10 crore. Guys, please write in the chat box. My question is that higher the limit, better it is or lower the limit, better it is from the point of view of the SSC. Higher the turnover limit, better it is or lower the limit, better it is from the point of view of the SSC. Please write in the chat box. Please write higher or lower. Which one is better, higher or lower? Which limit is better from the point of view of assessee? Higher limit or lower limit? Which is better from the point of view of assessee? Higher limit or lower limit? That is my question to you. Please write in the chat box. Jyotish says higher, Pankaj says lower, Rohit says higher, Megha says lower. Kirti says lower. So mixed, mixed. Pankaj has changed his stand. Wow, very good Pankaj. Pankaj changes his stand so often. Pankaj now says higher. <clears throat> Pankaj, please decide whether it's higher or lower. So guys, the correct answer is higher the limit, better it is. Why higher the limit, better it is? Because guys, if the limit is higher, then lesser SSEs will fall under tax audit ambit. If higher limit is there, then lesser assessees will fall under tax audit ambit. So higher the limit, better it is. That is the uh, principle which we are going to follow in this particular case. So higher the limit, better it is. So if 10 crore is the limit, then that is best for me because I will uh, uh, not be falling, uh, falling under the category of tax audit. Okay, sir. Got it. Okay. A simple illustration, guys. A simple illustration which you are going to do now. Okay. A simple illustration. These are the details which are given to you for a company. Purchase of material, cash, other, total. Then uh, uh, purchase of material, payment is made. Cash payment, other payment, total payment. Okay. Purchase of finished goods. <clears throat> there are some things which are purchased. Cash, other, total. Okay. Sales are made. Okay. Sales of good one. Sales of good one. Sales of good two, good two is being sold, cash others, in total it's given to you, you need to ascertain whether tax audit is applicable on this particular enterprise or not, whether tax audit is applicable for this enterprise or not. So guys, as we can see that, you know, um, the total turnover of the company is 616, 716 lakhs, 716 lakhs, which means 7 crores and 16 lakhs is the turnover limit of this particular company, 7 crores and 16 lakhs. Now, let's see whether the percentage of cash payments are less than 5% or not. So we have divided 4 by 463. Okay. So yes, it is less than 5%. It is less than 5% of the total payment. Now let's see the receipts, percentage of cash receipts. It's 38 divided by 716. It's more than 5% of the total receipt. 
so guys when it is more than uh, uh, more than um, uh, uh, 5% of the receipts then 10 crore limit is not applicable 10 crore limit is not applicable because for applying the 10 crore limit the condition is that your total cash receipts and payments should be less than 5% of the total receipts or payments so yes in this particular case tax audit will be applicable on this company because the cash receipts are more than 5% of the total receipts so the uh, tax audit will be applicable for this particular company in this particular example this is how we are going to analyze the applicability of tax audit and how tax audit is uh, required to be done all right let's come on to the last topic of this particular chapter guys and the last topic which we are going to cover in our revision is firm assessment partnership firm assessment how would assessment be done for a partnership firm okay how would assessment be done for a partnership firm sir why are we specifically dealing with firm assessment in a separate manner why can't we assess uh, you know firm in a similar manner as we do for any other business for, in, under the head pgbp why partnership firm is given a specific um, uh, stand over here why partnership firm is being discussed separately that is the question which uh, comes to our mind guys the specific feature of partnership firm is that partners and firms are one and the same thing they don't have a separate legal stance they don't have a separate legal entity for example a company is a separate legal entity from its shareholder okay but partnership firm um, has got a thin line of difference between partners and partnership firm this is the reason why we are going to deal with specific provisions for partnership firm assessment if you do not have specific provision for partnership firm assessment then assessees are going to misutilize the expenses and incomes provisions which we have in pgbp and they are going to reduce their taxable income now let us first understand what kind of payments are made from partners to partnership firm or vice versa okay so guys partners provide services to partnership firm and in return they get remuneration they get interest on capital they get profit sharing in return partners get remuneration partners get interest on capital and partners get profit sharing in the partnership firm that is the equation which is there between partners and the partnership firm now firm should follow the following conditions there should be an instrument or deed of a partnership <clears throat> that is a um, essential thing guys for a partnership firm okay if you want to make your partnership a legal partnership uh, in which enforceability of law is there with respect to the provisions of the partnership then guys um, it the, its in instrument should be there and deed should be there and should be a registered deed profit sharing ratio should be specified in the deed itself uh, in what ratio would the partners share the profits those ratios should be specified in the partnership deed itself that is the uh, second condition and the third condition is that there should be no failure under section 144 so guys 144 deals with best judgment assessment which means that if notices are not responded to and uh, the income tax act has um, uh, given you some ultimatum for filing your return of income or anything of that sort then you did not comply with those provisions so those provisions if you know uh, you are falling under 144 best judgment assessment uh, sections then guys these provisions will not be applicable to you and assessing officer is free to do assessment in the way he wants in the way he wants okay these provisions will be applicable only when 144 is not applicable that means best judgment assessment is not applicable and in the uh, chapter of assessment proceedings we are going to discuss in detail what do you mean by best judgment assessment now let's come on to our main provisions of the firm assessment allowability of expenditure in the hands of the firm and the income which is um, uh, given to the partners okay i've divided my discussion into two parts okay partnership firm will pay interest on capital to the partners partnership firm will pay remuneration to the partners okay these are the two expenditures which which partnership firm will make and this will be income for the partners this will be expenses for the partnership firm this will be income for the partners then share in profits will be uh, uh, given by the partnership firm to the partners this will again be uh, uh, appropriation of profit from the from the angle of partnership firm it will be uh, uh, the the income in the hands of the partners that these are the two uh, major payouts which we are going to deal in with this particular section okay now if you want to allow allowability to the partnership firm okay this is an expenditure this is an expenditure we want allowance in the partnership firm books of accounts if you want allowance in the partnership firms books of accounts you need to fulfill the following conditions which are the interest on capital should be authorized by the partnership deed without authorization you are not paying anything that is the first condition 
then payment after the deed uh, the the payment is made after the deed has been made and after the authorization is there in the deed only then payment is made payment within the statutory limits the payment should not be more than the limits which are given for interest on capital and remuneration which are given in the act so act is saying pay interest to your partner pay remuneration to your partner but subject to certain maximum limits you cannot pay unlimited amount to uh, your partners guys there can be a situation where partners um, uh, tax rate is less partnership firms tax rate is high in that case partnership firm will be lowered to pay higher amount of remuneration to the partners to pay higher amount of interest on capital to the partners just to save taxes just to save taxes so income tax act has restricted the amount of interest on capital which can be paid to a partner and allowed to a partner and remuneration which can be paid to a partner and allowed to a partner <coughs> income tax act, act has made those kind of restrictions now we'll come on, on to the statutory um, restriction in a short while now the question is whether both of these things will be allowed in hands of the partnership firm answer is if these are under the statutory limits then it is allowable in hands of the partnership firm but taxable in hands of the partner so partner will be paying taxes on this particular amount and it will be allowed as a deduction in hands of the partnership firm that is the principle the amount disallowed in the hands of the firm is exempt from the partners suppose if you pay amount which is more than your statutory limit then the amount which is more than the statutory limit will be disallowed and if the amount is disallowed then partner will not have to pay taxes on that particular amount partner will have to pay taxes only on the amount which is received by the partner and allowed in the hands of the partnership firm so the first condition is that the income should be allowed in hands of the partnership firm only then it will be taxable in hands of the partners that is the principal condition now what are the statutory limit guys statutory limits are given in the box i hope you are able to see the box clearly okay let me shift it a little bit yes now you can see the statutory limits very very clearly in case of interest on capital you can give it at max up to 12 percent per annum of the capital which is introduced in the business suppose if i pay 15 percent per annum as the interest on capital three percent will be disallowed three percent will be disallowed if i pay taxes if i pay interest um, uh, uh, which is which is more than 12 percent say 15 percent three percent will be disallowed yes guys so 12% interest on capital is allowed as a deduction more than 12% will be disallowed then remuneration to the partners the salary which is given to the partners um, uh, salary should be given according to the book profits of the partnership firm if book profits uh, first 3 lakhs of book profits 90% of book profit or 1.5 lakh rupees that is the maximum remuneration that can be paid um, on first 3 lakhs of the book profits then the balance book profits 60% of the book profits can be paid as remuneration. Remuneration cannot exceed salary. Remuneration means salary. Salary cannot exceed 60% of the book profits. Then if in case of a loss, 1.5 lakhs can be the maximum amount of remuneration which can be paid to the partners. Maximum amount which can be paid is 1.5 lakhs. If you pay more than 1.5 lakhs to your partners, then we will disallow that entire expenditure in hands of the partnership firm and allow it in hands of the partner. So that is how the remuneration is limited by statute. Okay, sir. What about share in profit? Guys, share in profit is not allowed as a deduction for the partnership firm. And if it is not allowed as a deduction in case of partnership firm, it is not taxable for the partners as well. It is not taxable for the partners as well. It is not allowed as a deduction of the partnership firm. It will not be allowed as the, um, it will not be taxable for the partners as well equity is maintained guys equity is maintained if it, it if it becomes a deduction for the partnership firm then it will become taxable for the partners but if it is not allowed as a reduction for the partnership firm then it will not be uh, taxed in the hands of the partners as well this is how the provision is laid down okay sir got it so guys this was the entire entire provision of firm assessment partnership firm how is partnership firm assessed in case of um, uh, uh, the limits which are given statutory limits how is partnership firm assessed that is the entire uh, concept of partnership firm and yes from standpoint of um, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, intermediate students as well as final students this is yes one of the most important topics of your syllabus partnership firm assessment especially for intermediate students especially for intermediate students a small questions from 
partnership firm uh, assessment can be asked in the examination so be prepared for a small question from this particular topic which is the firm assessment and guys hereby i'll i'll uh, conclude today's session